Hey guys, we'd like to welcome everybody to our annual elk hunting seminar. We are very blessed tonight to have Brian Barney here is going to be the guest speaker for us tonight. Uh, we're real excited that you guys are here. Uh, a lot of you probably know this, but we have a, a taco dinner, $10 a plate up there. It is limited, so uh, if you guys want dinner, you better grab it now. They were selling a lot of them uh, last time I was up there, so it's limited supply. Um, we've got a bunch of different things going on tonight, guys. We have got a Big Ten raffle, that Big Ten raffle. We got a pair of the Saguaro uh, 15 SLC binoculars, awesome optics. Um, you want to get your hands on those. We've also, thanks to Ross Outdoors, we have a bow choice. We've got all of the high-end bow, bows from Matthews, Hoyt and Prime. You can get the uh, Matthews V3, the Hoyt Ventum, or the Prime Nexus. All awesome bows, high-end bows. They retail for like over $1,200. We've got a bunch of firearms up there. We've got a Thompson Compass 30-06 rifle. We've also got a Smith & Wesson SD9 9mm uh, handgun. We've got a Canyon 103 Prospector cooler. Those Canyon coolers are awesome, keep ice for a long time. We've got a Slick Pro CF 733 tripod with an awesome head on it. We've got another Thompson Center Compass rifle uh, in 223 caliber. We've got a Ruger LC. P2 and 380, and we've got a Ruger EC9 9 millimeter. Tickets for that are $10 a piece, guys, um, and uh, we will be giving that stuff away tonight at the end of the seminar. We will end sales at that at 9 o'clock tonight um, or shortly thereafter. We've also got a pair of Saguaro NL Pures. 
Well, I, I think it's actually sold out. There were very few tickets uh, when I went by last time. I bet it's sold out now, but someone's going to win a pair of the, the newest, latest, greatest Saguaros, the NL Pures tonight. We've got some silent auction items, guys. We've got some great items with a silent auction. Um, one of the best items, in my opinion, I mean, not to mention the dove hunts, but we have a youth elk hunt. There's an, an opportunity for a youth hunter to go on an elk hunt uh, in units 5A, 5B, or 6A, and it's not just for this year. It's for 2021 or 2022, and the deal with that is that the kid would have to have a tag this year to go on the 2021 hunt. That is not that hard of a hunt to draw. It would be a fantastic hunt for a young man. It is going to be guided by the Richardson family, who's world-renowned hunters and stuff. They have a, a cabin up there. The accommodations will be awesome. I know that uh, a lot of people will be bidding on that for their kids, but that's an awesome hunt. We also have some awesome dove hunts, guys. We've got a dove hunt that is for the whole entire season, the early season, September 1st through September 15th for two hunters, and it is at a dairy that is actually surrounded by the city of Phoenix. It is a little uh, island, a county island that you can legally hunt doves on. So it's, I mean, it's literally like three or four miles from here. Great opportunity to shoot some doves. There is a two two person dove hunt. There is a three person dove hunt, and then there's also a four person. All of that stuff is on um, our silent auction stuff. And, and the way that you can get there is you can text C H A raffles to seven six two seven eight. That's uh, text C H A raffles to seven six two seven eight to bid on that stuff. It will be open and closed at nine o'clock. We've got free Bibles out there, guys. Um, a lot of literature and different things. We'll be back to talk about our vendors here in just a little bit. We've also got one other raffle going on. It's kind of a special tonight. It's it's our tumbler raffle, and you have the chance to win that red, white, and blue ice chest that's sitting out there. You can buy the black and red tumblers for only ten dollars a piece, and each one will have a minimum of three tickets in it. The twenty ounce. Uh, Tumblers, those are $20 a piece with a minimum of five tickets. And then the 30 ounce uh, silver tumblers are $30 a piece with a minimum of 10 tickets. And we will draw that tonight. So that, that's kind of a special we got going. Everybody, we're glad you're here. Uh, kids, we have got a hoverball game that is at the far east end of the atrium. If you go from the opposite end of where you came in, you can go down there and shoot the hoverball stuff, courtesy of Archery Headquarters. It's a lot of fun. The scouts are actually running that right now. So if you get a chance, go down there and check it out. It's a great uh, thing for the kids. We've also got a free raffle. We're going to be giving away three rifles to the kids tonight. We'll draw that during the opening ceremonies. And then we've also got a three vet raffle, thanks to Wilming um, Construction. We've got a 6.5 Creedmoor that we'll be giving away tonight um, through that. Everybody, we're glad you're here. Have some fun, get you some food, and we're going to get rolling here pretty soon.
can bring these ashes back to life when I am surrounded by flames I have this confidence when nothing else makes sense who else can take a tragedy and turn it into Together for my good oh, oh, You never fail You never will You're bringing turn around Just like you said you would Who else can take a tragedy And turn it into victory Who else, who got the news life will be changing nothing we can do the clock is ticking now all i can think about is knowing i have to move on without you somehow and i just can't believe that you're the one who's keeping it together as you hold my hand and say it's okay to cry it's okay to fall apart you don't have to try to be strong when you are not and it may take some time to make sense of all your thoughts but don't ever fight your tears because there is freedom in every drop sometimes the only way to heal a broken heart is when we fall apart You asked me to sing Some songs that I wrote But I can barely speak Can barely play a note All my tears rushing Falling on my strings That make the sound of these progressions Have a different ring and I hate to say goodbye Knowing this will be the last time we're together 
as you close your eyes and say, it's okay. It's been a while since you've been gone And sometimes I still catch myself trying to call your phone All the hopes and dreams we used to talk about They're still alive in me And I just hope I make you proud Now I'm your legacy And it's your love still holding me together and I still hear you say it's okay to cry it's okay to fall apart you don't have to try to be strong when you are not and it may take some time to make sense of all your thoughts but don't ever fight your tears cause there Is when we fall apart. Sometimes sorrow is the door to peace. Sometimes heartache is the gift I need. Your faith. Faithful, faithful in all things. In every heart, in every Shining through, calling on my friends, asking what's the move. Feeling a little different, I'm on something new. Today, today. I ain't gonna let no clouds get in my way. The only road I'm walking is the one I picked. Catch me sitting in the sun, no time for shade. Today, today. This is the day that the Lord has made. Ooh. And I ain't gonna let it slip away. I'm gonna be joyful. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm gonna be joyful. Today, I'm gonna be joyful. Ooh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, gonna be joyful. I got the feeling that you get when you get new kicks. Bell ringing on the last day of singing, yeah. High five and everybody, but we out of here. Life comes and goes, make it last, best slow your road. They don't take it as a choice, but you gotta know that today's the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I ain't gonna let it slip away, nah. I'm gonna be joyful. I 
got the joy, joy down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart. I got the J-O-Y, down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart. I got the joy, joy down in my heart. If I'm being honest, I didn't think you'd stay with all my problems. I was so afraid that when you saw them, you would turn your back on me and me. Cause in the silence, my insecurities are like a sour, taking over me and I can't hide.
happened to you? I hear it all the time. They tell me something's different in my words and in my eyes. What happened to you? They see it on my face. They got a million questions. All that I can say is Jesus happened. What you've done How could you fall so far You should be ashamed of yourself So I was ashamed of myself The lies I believed They got some roots that run deep I let them take a hold of my life I let them take control of my life Standing in your presence, Lord I can feel you digging all the roots up I feel you healing all my wounds up All I can say is hallelujah Look what you've done Look what you've done in me You spoke your truth into the lies I let my heart believe Look at me now Look how you made me new The enemy did everything that he could do Oh, but look what you've done Suddenly all the shame is gone I thought I was too broken, now I see You were breaking new ground inside of me Standing in your presence, Lord, I can feel you digging all my roots up I feel you healing all my wounds up All I can say is hallelujah
today it all begins I'm seeing my life for the very first time through a different lens yesterday I didn't understand driving 35 with the rocket inside didn't know what I had while I've been waiting to live my life's been waiting on me I'm gonna run no I'm gonna fly I'm gonna know what it means to live and not just be alive the world's gonna Cause I'm gonna shout And I will be dancing when circumstances drown the music out Say I won't Not enough Is what I've been told But it must be a lie Cause the spirit inside says I'm so much more so let them say what they want oh I dare them to try Elk Hunting Seminar. We're glad you guys are here tonight. Want to uh, just make a few quick announcements about some stuff that we've got going on and tell you a little bit about us. Um, we are Christian Hunters of America. Uh, we got started here in Phoenix about four or five years ago, and uh, we do a lot of family events. We do uh, group hunts. We do a bunch of community service stuff around the state um, and a lot of different things, and we do a bunch of raffles and fundraising and stuff. We help families in need, things like that. We actually have a bunch of literature and stuff that's out there at our CHA table. We've got some great deals on shirts and hats and things out there. Um, I'll tell you about some of the raffles here in a minute. There's information about uh, our organization and, and some of the things we do. We've got a lot of other awesome organizations out there, and I'll touch on those guys here in just a minute. We're blessed to have those guys here. Um, we got some raffles going tonight, guys. We actually had a set of NL Pures. Those things sold out like right away. Um, so those are gone, but we uh, have a Big Ten raffle out there. And with that Big Ten raffle, we've got uh, Saguaro 15s. We've got a, a bow choice, thanks to Ross Outdoors. You can get any of the top-of-the-line bows from uh, Matthews, Hoyt, uh, or Prime. Uh, we've got a couple of rifles out there, some handguns, a canyon cooler. We've got an awesome carbon fiber tripod um, some, and a couple of other 
things out there. We've got a Savage a 17 out there. There's 10 items out there. When you buy a ticket for that, they're $10 a piece. At the end of this uh, seminar tonight, we will draw those, and the winner will get to pick in order. So uh, if you're here, you will get to pick the uh, actual item in order. If you were picked first, obviously, you're going to have the first choice at uh, whatever's on the board, and then we'll just go down through that after that. We've got some silent auction stuff going on tonight, guys. We've got some awesome hunts. Uh, I think there's actually on the on the board right now, there's one of the dove hunts that's there. We have we're very blessed that one of our directors uh, has access to a dairy that is surrounded by the city of Phoenix. It is actually a county island and it's it's not too far from here. It is surrounded by the city of Phoenix, so it's not very far. And we've got hunts for two people. Uh, a hunt for three people and a hunt for four people. And those hunts are actually going to be for uh, the whole early dove season starting September 1st this year and running through September 15th. You have access to that uh, private dairy anytime that you want to go. So that's a great opportunity and it's real close to Phoenix here. We also have an awesome youth elk hunt donated by the Richardson family, world renowned hunters. Anybody that, that's into hunting much in Arizona knows the Richardson family. Great family, great people. They are going to offer a uh, youth elk hunt in unit 5A, 5B, or 6A. And that's going to be for this year if you have the tag, but it can also be for next year. Those tags are not that hard to draw. So even if your kids don't have a tag this year, uh, and you've got some kids, put them in for that hunt next year, bid on that hunt tonight. I will guarantee it'll be a great experience. They're very successful hunts. They've got a cabin up there. Um, I know some people that have gone up there and hunted with them and stuff and just had a fantastic time. And it's a great, great learning experience. You know, even for the dads that, that have hunted a little bit or haven't hunted at all or guys that have hunted a lot, the guys that have hunted a lot are going to want to really go because they're going to want to hang out with, with Corky and the crew and Russ and those guys because they're such good hunters. But uh, that youth hunt is coming up, and it is good for the 2022 season. We've got a hoverball thing for the kids, adults too. It is down at the east end of the atrium, the far end from where you came in. Go check that out. It's a lot of fun. It's for the, kind of set up for the kids, but the adults are welcome to shoot it as well. Uh, outside, you probably saw there's a whole bunch of water. That water's free guys that bottled water help yourself if you're thirsty grab grab some water it can actually come into the atrium there no food is supposed to come into the atrium and we've got that whole fellowship hall for eating and stuff last time i was out there they still had some tickets for the taco dinner for ten dollars a piece uh food's really good check that out We've got free Bibles out there with our displays and stuff. We've got another raffle that's kind of our special tonight. It's a tumbler raffle. We've got a bunch of different tumblers out there. You can buy one of the black or red 30-ounce tumblers for $10, and you get a minimum of three tickets. And then the 20 ounce ones you get for $20, you get a minimum of five tickets and the 30 ounce ones for $30, you get a minimum of 10 tickets. And what those tickets are for that you win is to win that little red, white, and blue ice chest out there. That's a little high end ice chest. It's awesome. Uh, if you saw it, you're probably going, wow, but, but that'd be something cool to win. And not, not only that, you take home an awesome tumbler, tumbler uh, coffee cup for a good price. With that, everybody, we're glad you guys are here. Just wanted to mention our some of our uh, vendors that are out there right now. Really appreciate them being here and great organizations. Do a lot, give back a lot. We're, we're so blessed to have Ross Outdoors here. They are one of our uh, biggest donors. Um, Josiah and those guys over there do a fantastic job. If you're at all into archery, you're going to want to make sure you check out Ross Outdoors. They're down there on South 17th Street, uh, kind of, you know, in the uh, Phoenix metro uh, downtown area and stuff. Got a great shop. They carry Matthews, Hoyt, Prime, um, got a great little range in there, air conditioned range. Go check them out. Arizona Elk Society is here tonight, too, guys. Um, they do so much. I, they haul water, I'll guarantee you, more than anybody um, you know in the whole state, including game and fish. I think they haul water for game and fish. And as dry as it's been, we really, really need that. They do a great job. We've also got Tom Wagner out there with the Heroes Rising Outdoors. And what they do is they actually will take a wounded warrior uh, out on a hunt. They'll get donated tags and stuff, and they will actually take these guys out they will orchestrate an entire hunt and take these guys on a hunt and it's it's such a blessing i've been blessed to be in a camp with with some of these hunts and just talking to the families of the guys and the hunters themselves that have been on there it is, makes a huge difference in their lives we've also got outdoor experience for all eddie's out there he does the same thing and he's also able to take uh, kids with life-threatening diseases and stuff like that fantastic organizations they do just so much it is just 
unbelievable what they do and the time and effort that they put into taking these these uh, wounded warriors and these kids with cancer hunting and stuff. What a blessing to have organizations like that. I think uh, Chris is out there with Western Hunter uh, Magazine. Um, he's he's out there. Him and Eddie are partners with a lot of stuff. Great guys. They do a lot for the for everybody. Uh, BCC Archery, Richie over there. He's up in New Rivers. Got a great archery shop up there. If you're in the North Valley, check them out. We've got paint works out there. You guys probably saw some of those paint, custom painted AR stuff and, and different things out there. They do some really, really awesome custom paint. You want to check them out. Ammo AZ is uh, Arizona's right there with them as well. Check out the stuff they've got. We've got Van Von Hansen's Meats out there. They're giving away free samples. You're going to want to give that a shot, but they've got a full-blown meat shop. They're not just a meat processor, which they do a great job with that, but they've got meats and spirits and they do a lot of neat stuff. Evolution Outdoors, some of you guys know Dale. He's got a, a killer uh, electric bike. He's also got the best broadheads, in my opinion, on the market. Fantastic broadheads. If you're in a, to bow hunting, check out his broadheads. You can actually see him at his table there. Um, Check them out. They're great. We've got Sundown, our guide service. You can see some of the animals and stuff they got. Very well known, very highly respected. They do a great job. If anybody's looking for a guided hunt, these are the guys you're going to want to talk to for sure. We've got a chapter of Christian Bowhunters of America, Santa Cruz Archers out there. Mark, stop and talk to them. They're actually out of Tucson. They do, do a real good job. But if they do different events around the state, check them out. We've got PVCI, which is a Phoenix Varmint Callers Incorporated. Something cool about Varmint Calling is that you can do it any time of the year. There's always a season open for coyotes somewhere, and it's a lot of fun, and uh, they do a great job. They do monthly meetings and things, too. Big supporter of us, and we support them. We've got the Junior Bassmasters out there as well. We actually support them and their team, um, and they travel around the state and actually around the nation and do some fishing. We've got Arizona Reel Works out there. Any of you guys that are into fishing, man, you guys have got to check out what Tyler's doing with these reels. It is unbelievable. You would not believe the difference that it makes if you get it, get a real tune, get it checked out. It does a real good job with that stuff, and he uses awesome bearings. It is unbelievable the difference. Anybody that's into fishing needs to stop by Arizona Reel Works and talk to Tyler over there. Full Draw Bow Hunters is here. Any of you guys that are archers, they've got their list of shoots coming up. They do shoots all around the state. Check them out. They do a great job. And if you and if you're into archery shooting the 3D archery shoots, it's fun. It's great practice, and it's a great family thing. Fun thing to do with the kids and and just a bunch of friends and kind of stuff. We've got also got Sun, Count, Sun Country Outdoor Adventures. Sorry, Cliff. One of my buddies owns that, and he's also uh, in part of Sportsman's Devotionals. Cliff does a lot of different concealed carry classes, all kinds of gun training and different things. He's able to get his own range out at Ben Avery. We do actually do private shoot days uh, with Christian Hunters of America and other organizations with Cliff. It's all orchestrated by him, but it's great because you have the range to yourself. You can kind of do what you want, and it, it's just a lot of fun out there. There's also a, a devotional called Sportsman's Devotional that you can subscribe to, and you can get that sent straight to your inbox every day or five days a week. It's a great uh, inspiration inspirational thing to get up and read in the morning. And with that, guys, we're blessed that you're here. We are going to actually get rolling about 6.45, so we probably got about another 20, 25 minutes or so, and uh, we're going to have the Boy Scouts bring in the flag and do the Pledge of Allegiance and stuff and get rolling with our program. We're really excited to have Brian and uh, Barney here tonight with the East, Eastman's Elevated, and uh, he's going to do an awesome presentation with elk hunting. Glad you're here, guys. Never stop believing Cause he's so, so good So, so good When I was just a kid I dreamed about the life I live By fancy cars and a new Cruise around with all my friends, with all my friends. But I've been waking up and realizing all those things look so much different through a screen. And that type of life ain't what it seems, isn't what it seems. The designer bags are not all bad, but I'll never find my worth in that. Play along and you'll get paid. 
I've been empty when I'm low you fill the cup yeah but my ego fights back telling me that I'm ready to grab the wheel and take control but I'll crash if I don't let myself let go you put the X on my fading Spirit when I'm low I hear it calling like a compass in my soul Saying, child, come on back now You've been gone too long Let me lead you back where you belong Right next to me Right next to me I've been captive By the plans I try to make Yeah, I've been selfish Callous hearts, they die hard like habits That I know I gotta break Ain't it good to know that help is on the way in my soul saying child come on back now you've been gone too long let me lead you back where you belong right next to me Spirit when I'm low I hear it calling like a compass in my soul Saying, child, come on back now You've been gone too long Let me lead you back where you belong I get this feeling in my spirit when I'm low I hear it calling like a compass in my soul
Hey guys, we are going to get rolling with the program here in five minutes. We're going to start off with a prayer here uh, in exactly about five minutes from right now. So any of you guys that are not uh, in right now in the main sanctuary, um, you guys might want to start heading this way to grab some seats. And we're going to get rolling here in just a few minutes, guys. got the news life will be changing nothing we can do the clock is ticking now all i can think about is knowing i have to move on without you somehow and i just can't believe that you're the one who's keeping it together 
As you hold my hand and say, It's okay to cry. It's okay to fall apart. You don't have to try to be strong when you are not. And it may take some time to make sense of all your thoughts. But don't ever fight your tears. Cause there is freedom in every drop. Sometimes the only way to heal a broken heart. Is when we fall apart. You asked me to sing some songs that I wrote, but I can barely speak, can barely play a note. All my tears rushing, falling on my strings, that make the sound of these progressions have a different ring. And I hate to say goodbye, knowing this will be the last time we're together. As you close your eyes and say, it's okay to cry, it's okay to fall apart, you don't have to try. Guys, we're going to get rolling with the program here in just about 30 seconds. We're going to start off with a prayer, then we're going to have the... Boy Scouts, bring in the flags, and we are going to do the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. We're blessed to have you guys here. We're also very blessed to have the Richardson family here tonight. Great to see them. Um, we are going to have who most of us call Gramps, George Richardson, very well-known hunter, very successful, great family. He's going to get up and do the prayer for us, guys. So um, anybody that's not in here, you got about 10 seconds or so to get in here and grab a seat. But with that, uh, George, would you like to come up and do the prayer for us? You know, first off, it's just so nice to see all these people. You can see their face, and you don't have to wait and look around. They got those masks off. That's a great thing. You know, before we before I pray, I I just like to share something with you a little bit that. Last night I was reading in Genesis when God created all these magnificent creatures that we look forward to every year to go hunt and everything. And how he gave Adam, told him, I'm going to let you name all of these, okay? I thought, wow, what a privilege that was. But I got to thinking, he gave us dominion over all of those waterfowl and all the animals and all of that. So he gave us quite a responsibility, too, because we're still responsible for all of these creatures out there. So when you're out there this year, you know, and you see all of these animals, just thank your Lord and Savior because he's the one that made them for you. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much tonight for all of this time that we can get together as friends. And, oh, I would hope that most of us, Lord, are Christians and I just thank you for the opportunity we have when we go out in the woods and things, and we've had I don't know how many people that gave their heart to the Lord out there on a, watching the sun come up or whatever it might be, and we just pray that you would give each and every one here tonight, Lord, mercy as they travel, and Father, let us all when we get out there in the woods and things, it's, it's not about all you kill. It's just about being out there with families. And, Father, we just ask that you would all give us all the, uh, well, just keep us out there, Lord, that we have a good, clean mouth and we don't have to have that tree stand. We don't have to have that water hole. But you'll provide for us anyway. So we're just going to ask that you would trust, that we would trust, and let people know that we are Christians. And we pray and ask your blessings on this tonight for these guys that do a lot of work here. And we just praise you and thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, George. That was a great prayer. Guys, if everybody would stand, we are going to do the flag ceremony. We are going to bring in the flags.
please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets With that, guys, we are actually, everybody, if you guys would like to take a seat, that would be great. We are actually going to have a couple of recognitions. Uh, Mike Ronoski, are you in? Come on in. We are very, very blessed, you guys, uh, by the people that serve this country. And uh, we're going to do a veteran recognition, and Mike's going to lead us with that. And he's going to tell you a little bit about an awesome uh, construction company here in the Valley that has helped us out a lot. And have a little discussion about that, guys, but we're going to be giving away a 6.5 Creedmoor rifle to one of the lucky veterans, and we're going to have the Boy Scouts will actually hand out those tickets here uh, afterwards. When when the Boy Scouts come to you guys, they're going to have a cup in their hand. They actually have a bracelet for you, a little silicone bracelet, red, white, and blue. There's red, and there's white, and there's blue, and then they also have a ticket in there. Uh, split the ticket in half. Give them back the ticket. They'll bring it back up here, and we're going to put it in the... Uh, draft will run up here and we're going to do that that okay uh will main construction so what can we say we've always honored our veterans and as you can see we love we love america and everything it represents and one of the things that building this relationship with will main construction over the years they came to us and said that we love what you guys do but we love our veterans even more than you guys it was kind of an inside joke and it says what is the most hottest rifle that everybody wants? And of course, everybody was talking about the Creedmoor. So they started this tradition where they just want to honor all the veterans and give away a free Creed Creedmoor. So we're going to have tickets passed around. So if we can have all of our veterans stand, we want to first uh, give you a round of applause. So please stand up. So it's, it's truly... The individuals like you guys that sacrificed, I think in a lot of ways, America forgot that if it wasn't for the dedication and what you guys did in serving our military and giving us these freedoms, we would not be here today. So we thank you. So with that, Wilming's going to give away a free rifle. So we're going to pass that out. Then uh, he'll come give you a thing and he'll meet you and get you a brand new rifle. So let's give away. Make that happen. Okay. Hey guys, from Wilming Construction, we want to thank all you veterans. Uh, it's because of people like you, we get to have our freedom maintain our freedom every year. Uh, Wilming is very proud to be part of this event every year, uh, obviously last year being our asterisk year. So uh, we like to continue the tradition. Uh, this will be the second time we carried this uh, two years ago in the 2019. Um, I believe the guy's name was uh, Dave Waters who won it last time. I don't know if he's here today, but um, you know, want to say thank you again, and for all those standing, obviously grab your tickets, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, giving away a 6.5 Creedmoor.
Does everybody just have one ticket, guys? Everybody just have one ticket, the veterans out there? We're gonna draw guys that is actually for a ruger model 6973 6.5 creedmoor awesome rifle one of you vets is gonna have the opportunity to pick that up at bear mountain in mesa uh and we're gonna draw that right now let's draw that let's draw that number mike He's going to read the number for you. Six, one, one, zero, four, nine. Zero, four, nine. Z Z zero, four, nine. It's going. Sorry, guys. Six one one zero six three. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Six one one. We'll get it right, guys, one of these days. One six one one zero zero three. Zero zero three. Oh my gosh. Lesson learned. <laughs> Don't give out the cups or no, it's not the cups. <laughs> six one one zero three three. We're going to have the Girl Scouts next time. <laughs> I've never been offended by something I 100% agree with. All right, come on, you got the number. Okay. 611001. Zero, zero, one. 001. Zero, zero, come on up. Let's get a picture. Whoa! How was that for entertainment, guys? With that, guys, uh, we are actually going to, we're going to do the kids' raffle now. We've got three different guns, and if you guys don't mind, can, can somebody bring the guns in here? But we're going to actually give away, we need to get our directors in here, and any of the kids that are in here, we've got uh, two cricket rifles. There is one that is desert tan, there's one that I believe is pink, and then we also have a, uh, a bigger rifle, and the kids can pick out any one that they want if they want a bigger one. Uh, if we could get the directors up here to hand out tickets to the kids, all the Boy Scouts are going to have an opportunity to do it. If you kids still have tickets in your hands right now, let's get rid of those tickets. You can just actually drop them on the stage, and we're going to use the same ones again.
future right here. We're very blessed to have these kids here. Looking forward to giving them a firearm. We've got that uh, pink cricket, guys. We also have that in desert tan, and then we've got this uh, actually bolt action rifle, the Savage here. They're all 22 long rifles. We're gonna draw three winners right now. If your son or daughter wins a rifle tonight, we'll have to get with you and get your information and stuff. Let's draw those tickets. Ticket number one, 611 right on. Of you holding the rifle real quick? Where's Chet at? He's right there. Yep. Jesus. All right, six one one zero nine six zero nine six. Nice. We got one more mic. Last one, guys. Six one one zero eight seven zero eight seven. Yeah. Woo. Now, which one do you want, the pink one or this one? Yeah. Let's get a picture of that. Woo. This young lady probably has more firearms in her name at her gun closet at home than all of us combined. That's one of the Richardsons.
That's awesome, you guys. With that, guys, um, that, that's done with the presentations and stuff. We're actually going to turn it over to um, Mike. He was going to introduce Dale, and Dale is going to introduce Brian. Okay, so um, as we know, we normally have all of our elk seminars. This year we're filming live on YouTube, and uh, we're excited to be back. But anybody that knows when we came to doing the elk seminar, there was one person that kind of started this, and he wasn't able to be with us today, so that is Corky Richardson. So a lot of you guys know Corky, so we just, as, Christ, as, a, as previously Desert Christian Archers, we started with him, and through Christian Hunters of America, he has been the foundation of what we did that started these seminars and, and basically led us to up to this highest level. So even though Corky wasn't able to be here with us tonight, we just wanted to let him know that we love him, we appreciate him, and he is really the foundation that's allowed us to have this. So just one public let everybody know that we do appreciate him, even though we're bringing in a phenomenal person. Uh, Brian's flew all the way in the, from today from Wyoming, and uh, we, it's an incredible opportunity to have Eastman's part of this and again, this is part of the legacy of Mr. Richardson. So with that, and we have John come up and uh, Dale. So Dale is the creator of some of the best broadheads that the world has to offer, Gravedigger, then it came to Evolution Outdoors, and now he does electric bikes, and Dale is actually a really good friend. So I'm going to let him introduce Brian, and let's talk uh, elk hunting. So that's why we're all here, so thank you. So, as most of you know me, or if you don't know me, um, my name is Dale Perry. I started uh, my company, and uh, Christian Hunters of America, used to be Desert Christian Archers, helped me get started in the broadhead business, and I, uh, I created Gravedigger Broadheads and sub subsequently sold that company, and which was what led me to the introduction of Brian Barney, our guest speaker. So I, had, uh, I was at the Sportsman's Expo, and I gave my broadheads to Guy Eastman. And so he was intrigued with them when he was doing the speeches at the Sportsman's Expo. And so they reached out to me, and they said, hey, we would, we're interested in these broadheads. And this was back in 2013, 2012. And... Um, so I sent them a bunch of broadheads. Well, subsequently, they sent them to the guy that tests broadheads, Brian Barney, So, um, which has started my relationship with Brian over the years. And uh, the Eastman family is a lot like the Christian Hunters of America. They're a family. They're 100% uh, straight-up gentlemen, um, and they do things the right way. And it was uh, an honor. Mike had asked me if I knew somebody that would be interested in coming out. And Brian, you know, he was probably my 25th choice, but he was available. So, but uh, no, I, he, it came to just, it was a, a natural for him. So he does a lot of their speaking and, um, and represents Eastman and does such a great job. And uh, I love it. He's been using my products for well, since 2013, and um, has really done really well in the in mule deer hunting and elk hunting and antelope hunting and everything else that he puts his mind to it. So the e-bikes are um, they're a new venture for us, hence the name. And uh, so we're we're in the e-bike business now, and um, there's a few people here that have them, and they're a game changer. They're one of those things that once you use it, you go, oh, I get it. And so they have a range from 25 to 40 miles. Uh, they will go faster than you will ever want to go on a trail. Um, and, but they will get you to places that you would never thought possible. And I do believe in the future, the way things are going, all the road closures that we've been dealing with for ATVs and, and side-by-sides and everything, that this will be the future. So with nothing else, you guys are probably tired of listening to me. I'm going to introduce Brian Barney, a good friend of mine and uh, let him take it away. Perfect. I think they got me a mic. I'm all set up. Yep. Okay. My name is Brian Barney. Thanks for the introduction, Dale. Um, man, uh, his broad heads are unreal, those evolution heads. Uh, the last few bulls I've killed have been with those evolution heads, and, and they haven't made it very far. And, and I've been shooting his broad heads now since he stated like 2013, so probably like my la last eight or nine bulls have came from those heads. So they're just awesome. Uh, make sure to check them out. Great for mule deer, for elk, for everything. But 
Um, really happy these guys had me come down. Like, what an event to put on a free event like this. Uh, give a rifle to our veterans. Thanks to our veterans for their service. Uh, give rifles to these kids. This is amazing. Um, so, so I'm just happy to be part of it. Um, I, I'm just a, a blue-collar bow hunter that fell in love with bow hunting. Uh, I'm 41 now. At 19, uh, I, I grew up in western Washington. At 19, I was just looking for more opportunity. Like the seasons were short, and, and I saw this land opportunity moving out west. And so uh, able to move out to Montana and get way more opportunity there. And I just, I immersed myself in it. Like anything I could learn about elk, whether it was horn hunting, whether it was elk hunting, elk glassing, I was there. And, and that's the deal with this western bow hunting is, uh, you know, it, I, I know here in Arizona, you guys have some great tags. And, and if you're lucky enough to draw one of those tags, you got a good chance at a good bull. But it's not about the tag you draw. Uh, you can draw one of these tags, and if you don't have the elk hunting experience, it's tough to go in there and be successful. It, it's also a matter of building your skill set where you show up to the trailhead and you're undeniable. Uh, you show up to one of these good tags, and you've built this skill set, and you've worked your way up this trophy ladder to where you can set your sights a touch higher. Um, so I, I've spent my years gaining this experience and this knowledge around elk, and, and being consistently successful on elk uh, on any game animal, for that matter, it's multifaceted. Uh, there's all these different skill sets that go into being su successful. Um, you know, there's your mental game and mental toughness. Uh, there's your stalking skills. Uh, there's your shooting skills, your glassing skills, locating elk, e-scouting, elk knowledge, elk behavior. There's all these different facets that go into it. A and if you lack in one of these skill sets... You know, you can come up short on these hunts. So it's about improving all these skill sets. And, and it's about really looking at yourself uh, uh, and, and looking for your greatest weakness and trying to improve it. So I believe it all begins and ends with the mind. Uh, it, it's all about setting your mind to it. And, and we're building habits, no matter if they're good, good or bad, all the time. And, and we're also, we're getting good at things. And it may not be the things we want. It may be eating poorly, or it may be uh, uh, making excuses, or it can be the good things, the good habits that you're building, getting those workouts in, shooting your bow. And, and there's a lot that goes along with this successful hunting, too. Uh, I, I've learned so many life lessons through hunting. Um, it's such a great uh, arena, or, or it's such a, a great place to learn these lessons about discipline and about mental toughness and, and fortitude. And, and if you're going to be a backcountry hunter, you're going to fail. You're going to have to come up and show resilience. You know, you're going to fail whether that's on a stock or whether it's on a shot, and you're going to have to pick yourself up again. Uh, other things that go into it, when you, when you look at your hunting and what's really holding you back, um, you know, the, the most important thing out there is family. And that's included for me. And I spend a bunch of time hunting, uh, but I couldn't do it without the support of my wife and the support of my family. And so for, for me to be a successful backcountry hunter, you know, I've got to make sure my family's taken care of. I got to make sure my responsibilities are taken care of. So like, like I got I to gotta speak my wife's love language. I got to make sure her love cup is full at the end of the year when September comes. So I put a lot of work and effort uh, into my family and making sure that everybody's taken care of. I mean, we're planning vacations, and my vacation isn't sitting on a beach, you know. It's bow hunting somewhere in the mountains. Like, that's where I love to be. But I know this is so important to put in the time and effort and make sure that, that she's fulfilled and that she's happy so she supports my passions. Make sure she knows how important it is to me to be out there chasing my dreams. So... I, I fell in love with chasing elk. They've got to be the most thrilling animal to chase with a bow and arrow. I mean, you're talking a, a seven, 800 pound animal that, that's screaming with these bugles and this, this rut behavior that takes place in about a four to six week time window. Uh, it, it is an amazing time to be part of in the woods, to take in and observe these elk. Uh, they've got five foot of, of fighting antlers above their head, you know? If done right, 300 inches, 320, 350 inches of antler above their head. It's absolutely amazing. It's the most thrilling bow hunting I've ever done. And this bow hunting, this ties back to our DNA. This, is, this was in our ancestors. Like it's, it's bred into us. Us as humans, we only survive from our ability to hunt. 
There's a reason why we get so excited when you see a bull through your spotting scope or you're making a play on one or you're getting close and with a bow and arrow to be a stone's throw away from them, to be immersed into this world. Like there's no feeling like it. You know, and buck fever's real. If you've ever been at full draw on a bull, it's real. Like these, these elk are big animals, but boy, you can miss them just uh, uh, clean as day, you know, if you don't have your wits about you, if you're not clutch in these situations and in, in, in these uh, opportunities that you get. So, so elk hunting, I want to go through some of the skill sets and kind of how I hunt elk. And this is where it's going to differ from a lot of elk seminars that you've heard. Um, I don't carry any calls with me. I, I don't carry a cow call, I don't carry a bugle, I don't make a sound. Now this is kind of new. I spent 10 years calling to these elk and I called a lot of bulls in. And, and what I found is, is I called a lot of satellite bulls in, that these herd bulls were tougher. And a lot of these places I hunt, um, I, I'm hunting general seasons and I'm hunting over the counter tags. So I'm hunting real high pressure elk. They've heard every call out there. And, and not that you can't call. Like calling is one of the most effective ways to kill elk. And more elk are killed by calls than any other style of hunting. But I just want you to take something from this seminar. And if you learn this elk behavior and these elk habits and how they move through the mountains and this higher understanding of these elk, you'll kill more bulls, whether you're calling or whether you're spot and stalking. But the way I like to do it is I like to keep the element of surprise. I like to spot and stalk these bulls. Um, uh, when, when I'm looking for these bulls, like the, the, the best way to kill bulls or the best way to kill consistent bulls is to be into bulls, is into finding them. So that all starts with your e-scouting. Like you draw a tag and then it's a matter of breaking down this unit and figuring out where you're gonna go. And when I look at my e-scouting, I, I can't point to a place on a map and tell you elk are gonna be there. Elk are nomadic by nature. They'll cover a, a range of country. They'll work 20 miles of different feeding features and different bedding features. And you can go into the best elk drainage in the world and you can be two days late or you can be two days early and there can be no elk in that drainage, even though it's a money elk drainage. Elk are nomadic. So they move through this country and they use this country to their advantage. They find these, these feeding, these bedding features, these wallows, and then they move through and they use it. And so elk hunting's all about timing. So they're nomadic. You have to be nomadic as well. Elk hunting for me is covering country to locate these elk. And so when I'm looking on my e-scouting and I'm breaking down potential areas of interest, like I'm just looking for really good elk country. I'm looking for big drainages and I want to find country that links to other drainages where I can get on a ridgeline and I can roll and I can look at four or five places, six places. I can maybe camp where, somewhere for a night and then I'm going to plan to move and camp somewhere else for a night and cover another few drainages. You have to be nomadic. I never do good when I'm waiting for elk to show up. You know, or I, I get into a place and I see a bunch of elk sign and there's no elk there. So, so when I'm e-scouting or when I'm looking for these places, I, I'm looking for elk habitat and I'm looking places that I can link it together. And, and then I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna go put boots to ground. I'm gonna go try to find these things. And, and when I'm e-scouting, like... Uh, I'm going to make myself an elk plan, and I'm going to have more plans than days that I can cover. Like when I go through and I make an elk plan, when I'm e-scouting, like I may make one potential area and the different drainages that I'm going to look and maybe three potential places that I'm going to move my camp. And, and I'm going to write all this down in a notebook, and then I'm going to look at features that I like. Now, elk love to bed on north-facing slopes. Uh, they love to be on slopes that are 30 degrees or less. Less. And, and there's so many different tools that you can use to, to e-scout, and they're all different pictures. Like uh, Onyx doesn't use the same uh, uh, pictures or satellite imagery as Google Earth uses or Gaia uses. There's multiple of these different platforms that you can look. And, and as you're looking at Onyx, you can start to cycle through date lines on this, or uh, uh, on Google Earth, start to cycle through these date lines to turn the feeding features green, to see where the greenest spots uh, elk like to be in sparse cover, like to be on the edge of meadows. There, there's five times the food diversification on the edge of meadows than there are in the center of the meadows. There's also five times the diversity uh, 50 yards into the timber, within 50 yards of the edges. They love to work the edges of meadows. You ever notice when you glass into a meadow, you don't see those elk standing right in the center of it. They're on the edges of it. 
They love to work those edges, and it's for a good reason. It's because of that, that food diversity right in there. They get a bunch of their feed in those edges. It's where they like to be. So I'm constantly looking for feeding features. This is where I like to hunt these elk. Uh, so I'm looking for sparse timber. Uh, up north, you know, where I'm at in Montana, we have a bunch of this beetle kill. Well, that beetle kill kills these trees, and it lets that sunlight through, and that sunlight then can grow that good grass down on the bottom. So I, I'm looking for beetle kill areas. I'm looking for, for meadows, and, and then I'm looking for sparse cover. And elk also love bottoms. The bottoms are the greenest part in, in, this, in the mountains in there. It's where they get the most water. So I'm trying to go through and I'm trying to e-scout these spots and I'm making myself a plan for this area I'm going to hunt. And then I, I've got a, a plan to go hunting, uh, where I'm going to park my truck, where I'm going to hike through, and I've got a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. More hunting plans than I can get to. There is no worse feeling than being in your tent five days in the hunt and wondering where you're going to go tomorrow. You don't think clearly when you're in the middle of this hunt. Like you're going to be tired, you're going to be sleep deprived, uh, you're going to be hunting for days, and, and, and you're going to have to ride the highs and lows of these hunts. Like I talk about how thrilling these hunts are, like, like the adventure of it, being able to go into a world that's unnerfed and make your own decisions to keep yourself safe and to try to harvest one of these bulls. And it's a beautiful thing. It's like to be able to focus on elk hunting all your other worries wash away. That bill that you got to pay, that thing at work, it's all washed away because the only thing you can focus on is elk hunting. And that's a good release for us humans. It's, a, it's an amazing state to be in, in this, this, this flow state where you're only thinking about trying to kill a bull. Like that's where I love to be. But I just know that I'm going to be worn down on this hunt. I may go multiple days without seeing an elk. In fact, the, the biggest bull that I've killed, I, killed, I harvested my best bull to date last year. And uh, I hunted an area that I've hunted for six or seven years. Uh, it's, a, it's a great area, high elk populations, a lot of nice big six points in there. I love hunting it. So I have this game plan, but every year is different. Like the moisture you're going to get is different. The feed's going to be different. The way the elk move through country is going to be different. And so um, I started going in, and I've got these hot spots, and I call it heat checking. And so I'll go into these spots and I was averaging over a half marathon a day going into these spots, covering miles like I'm telling you guys. Like, I'm nomadic like the elk are. I don't wait for elk to show up. I go find them. So here I get to this spot, and I'm elk hunting, and I know this country really well. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, there's a couple different tactics I use. I'll go into my backpacking tactics. For this place, I'm using a truck camp. Uh, because it's like this huge unit that's 300 square miles where the elk can be anywhere inside of these 300 square miles. So it's this giant place. So what I do is I, I camp at my truck and then every night I'm parking at a spot or every morning I'm parking at a spot and I'm hiking way into these spots and trying to locate elk into these drainages. And so um, I start hiking in and heat checking all these spots that have been good to me over the years. I've killed bulls in a lot of these spots. I know this is classic elk habitat. And I can see the sign in there. But as I get into these spots, I'm having a tough time locating elk. And the way I locate elk, I, uh, I'll use a master vantage point for elk. But a lot of times during September, I'm using a mobile vantage point. So I'm working my way up a drainage. I'm working my way up a ridge line, and, and I'm glassing all the openings. Like I have OCD, every opening I can see, I'm pulling up my binos and I'm looking. I'm trying to find these elk. I'm also listening. You know, elk bugle whether you're calling at them or not. They're going to rut no matter if you are there or not. They're going to breed those cows, and they're going to bugle. They're going to fight off satellite bulls. So a lot of times, just listening. And, and elk, they're morning and night. You can also hike into the best elk drainage with 300 head of elk in there. And if you get in there, say you start hiking at daybreak, and you get in there at 8.30, 9 o'clock, they can all be put away in the timber. And you see zero elk, you hear, you hear zero bugles. Like all of a sudden, you're thinking, there's no elk in here. i got to move to the next spot. No, you were just there at the wrong times got to be there at that morning and night. And elk do the majority of their rutting at night. And this is super important for you guys that are in Arizona too. Like the hotter it gets, the, the more they're going to rut at night. So, so your window of time is really short in the morning. Like you may only have 15 minutes of daylight to catch those elk before they put away in that timber to, to recognize and to be able to see them and locate them and have some elk to hunt. Again, the key to killing elk is being into elk. The more elk that you can be into, the more chances you can create. You can create one of those opportunities, get narrow into a bull. 
Um, so I hunt a lot of, and, and use the nights. Now, that doesn't, I don't have a night sight or a flashlight. I'm not trying to shoot these things in the dark. But what I'm doing is I'm trying to locate them. So this morning and night is super important. And then what I'll do is in the morning, I'm leaving two hours before light. And the whole way into my hunting spot, I'm listening the whole way in, stopping and listening. I'll also camp in a spot. Like this is where you add a hunt. So we're all limited on time and you get two hunts a day. You get a morning and an evening. I also get a night hunt. I'll camp at the top of a big drainage and I'll listen all night long. If I hear the elk bugling down there, well, I've got elk located for the morning. I've got a solid play. If I don't hear anything, well, I just sat there during the night when they do their biggest rut fest down in the bottom and I didn't hear anything. I'm gonna go hunt somewhere else. So I'm using these nights. Uh, also, like at, at, at dark, when it gets dark, like my evening hunts, as I'm hiking out, I'm listening. And even as I make it out, I'm gonna go hike to spots at, at nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. Like I'm working to locate elk in the night because they bugle like crazy. This is where you can hear them and get into that elk party. And it's one thing to locate, you know, herd of cows with one bull, but, but elk like being around other elk. They're nomadic, but they're also herd animals. They travel in these herds, and it's not just one herd. It's not just one six-point bull with the cows. Like, if you can find a six-point bull with the cows, and you just walk that direction, chances are there's other groups of elk in there, and it's a whole elk party. It's a whole elk rut fest in there. Elk like being around other elk. So once you can find the first group, it's just a matter of getting into them there. So I, I use these nights. They're super important. You can cover country at night to locate these things. Uh, and, and then morning and nights, I have to be at the right place at the right time. So I'm leaving the trailhead early. I'm staying up there till, com- till it's dark uh, so I can be able to locate these things. You know, and a lot of times you see them a long ways off. And, and this is one of the facets of hunting that I, I put so much emphasis in is my physical uh, preparation. Like this is also where I build a lot of my mental toughness is in my training. Like I make myself run day in, day out. Like these elk can cover so many miles and these mountains are brutal and carrying weight, elevation, like those are the equalizers. So that's what I work on. You know, I run, I used to do marathons and ultra marathons. I I don't do any of the races anymore. I run every day and I run the mountains. I gain 1,000 feet of elevation, 2,000 feet of elevation. I get my legs ready so there's no elk too far for me to go for. It also builds discipline. Like discipline is one of the, the main characteristics that you need to be a good elk hunter. You need discipline. You need to make yourself do it day in, day out. When times get tough, you need to rely upon your game plan. And so I build this discipline through making myself run day in, day out. And I live in Montana, like uh, wintertime, it gets 20 below, it's blowing 30 outside. You can bet I'm lacing up my running shoes even though I get home at, di- at dark and, I- and I'm going for a run. Be- why? Because I make myself do it. So when I'm on this hunt, you know, I'm not gonna give in. I'm not gonna give up early. So this hunt I'm telling you guys about, I'm going in and I'm heat checking all these spots and uh, I'm averaging 14 miles a day into these different locations trying to locate elk. One of the major challenges you'll run into, you run into hunting pressure, elk like being where humans aren't. So you just find a different area. That wasn't such my problem last season. It it was more so the elk just weren't in these areas. So I heat checked these areas and I went for five days where I never got on a shooter bull. So morning and night covering these crazy amount of miles and going in there and I can't find a bull in any of my honey holes, any of my spots where I found elk previously. It's a weird year, the feed burned off quick. Uh, They just tend to be in different places. So uh, back to my game plan. So this is a spot I've hunted seven years. I don't even need to write down a game plan, but I do. I've got multiple game plans that I've written down, that I've e-scouted, that I've looked at. Again, this is paying your dues to hunting. Like being a successful hunter is living the bow hunting ethos. It's living that bow hunter lifestyle, 365. It's working hard towards your goals year round so you can accomplish them when September's here. So I go back to my game plan and I start looking and I have this big drainage that I've always wanted to get into that I've never gone to. Uh, It's a few mile drive, you know, down and I got to park in this new spot and dive in. And so I dive into this new spot. I dive in there and I'm working this ridge line in the evening and I get down there and pretty soon I see a couple cows down in the drainage. These are the first elk I've seen in five days. 
You know, I'm striking out everywhere I go, all these spots that I knew. This is a new spot that I went, and all of a sudden I pick out a few cows. And then all of a sudden I just see the one. He's just got long times, just this great big six point, and he's rutting these cows. And, and I'm always waiting for my all in moment. Like part of this spotting and stalking is wait until they're susceptible, wait until they put themselves in a bad position where you can stalk in on them. So I, I get in on this bull, and I've, I've got a good win, and uh, it's like a canyon, and he's on this face, and I'm on this face, but the wind's blowing over the top, so I can't approach from above these elk. And, and a lot of this, uh, uh, when you're elk hunting, elk hunting are meant to be hunt aggressively. Like, mule deer are played slow and methodically and planned out, and you may take an hour to go 10 steps, and you're stalking this buck in his second bed, and you're trying to shoot him. Elk are not that way. Elk are aggressive. You see elk, it's like move into elk and then adapt to the situation which you're given. Because when you see elk, they're not going to be in the same place when you get there. So, so you got to rely upon these instincts. Again, this, this flow state of elk hunting where you're making these decisions quick. And there's a hundred decisions you're going to have to make and rely upon your instincts to getting close to these elk. So when you see elk, like the first thing is, is which way is the wind coming? And, it, and it's not just checking your wind checker and going, oh, okay, it's going this way. I'm going right at him. Like it's a higher understanding of the winds. It's this higher understanding of the directionals and the thermals. So the, the thermals, uh, and you guys are well aware of this in Arizona, but the thermals, if you're up on the mountain, uh, what happens is the sun comes up, the sun warms that valley floor, the air heats up around that valley floor, and that air starts to rise. And it rises, and it finds its way up all the lows of the mountain, and it rises up. And so all the canyons, these thermals switch around. So once that ground heats up, those thermals are coming up. So that's about 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. Before the sun gets on the valley floor, before the sun gets on this range, you can count on a downhill thermal. It's dark, the air is cool, so, so this is the adverse. As the air cools up top, as those mountains start to get shaded, that air starts to cool and it starts to fall. It starts to fall down these canyons. Those are your thermal winds. And, and these thermal winds, it's about learning these things. It's about paying attention throughout your hunt. So it's not just when you find a bull and you're making a play, you, you should have a notebook full of five days of winds in this country that you've already been hunting. So you know which direction it's going and how those thermals operate in those mountains. Uh, you also have your directional winds. Your directional winds, a lot of times they can forecast these directional winds. You can look on your weather app and it'll tell you southwest nine miles an hour. Or uh, I use this app called Windy. So it's this red app. It's got a white W on it. You pull up this app and it'll show your mountain range and show the directionals which way they're going and the speed up. So I'm planning my hunt due to this. I want to hunt with my, my face into the wind. And the wind is so important when stalking these elk. So it, it's like getting this higher understanding of the wind. So when you do get a chance at that bull, you know how these winds are affecting in the mountain and you can almost forecast or predict what the winds are gonna be when you get there. And, and then it's keeping tabs on the wind. And I love those wind checkers. Uh, the, the new one that I just found that I love is like uh, uh, this uh, wind drifter, what's it called? It's, uh, uh, it, it's this little piece of fiber that you let loose and then you can just watch it drift in the wind and you can watch it go down and catch a thermal or catch a directional. It's like a wind drifter. It's even better than the wind smoke. I really like it. Uh, but it's keeping tabs on this wind. So anyways, I get in this canyon. I see this giant bull. He's got two, three satellites around him, about 20, 30 head of cows, and, and I can't approach from over the ridge. Again, you, you learn these lessons hunting elk and it, it, and it dictates you know, your instincts and your elk knowledge. And it's learning from this. And so I've been in this position before and I've tried to cheat the wind and come over this ridge on these elk. You know, and I just know I've been blown. I, I don't know, I, like uh, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. I almost have to make the same mistake three, four, five times over before I finally learn my lesson. Well, I've made this one enough where I finally learned my lesson to not try to cheat the wind and come over top that ridge. So uh, I try to approach this side on the canyon. I can get about 100 yards away from this elk. I can't get any closer. And so I end up backing out. There was no play on this elk. I left him bugling in there. No people around. He's way in this drainage. I hiked all the way out. Uh, come back the next morning. I'm in there at daybreak. I catch him down in the bottom and he's down in the bottom and he's rutting these cows again. And I get within a couple hundred yards. And what I like to do is I like to coyote or shadow this herd. Once I find these elk, I like to move with them but be out of sight and keep this element of surprise. 
And so I'll just shadow this herd and I'll just move with them and I'll wait for my opportunity. As these, you know, and I like to hunt these elk in their feeding features. I like to be able to see them so I can read the mannerisms of these elk and their attitude. I can read the cows and I can look and see if, if their ears are erect or their heads are up and they're looking around for danger. I can tell they're alert. I know that I need to freeze at this point. You know, it's also the, the, the bulls, like, I mean, you've got five foot of antler above their heads. You can really read their horns as you're sneaking up too. It's a great indicator of how that bull's reacting and what he's doing. But I leave these elk and uh, come back the next morning. I find them in the bottom in there and they're rutting. But I can tell, like, I'm 200 yards away. There just isn't a play. For me to find a play, I've got to have the right ungulation, the right cover. If you're just moving in open terrain towards them, they're going to see us. So it's really reading the terrain and, and then being able to utilize it. So I'm going to shadow these elk. A great opportunity to kill these elk is right before they bed. Um, so elk love to move and they love to walk uphill. So once they start moving from their feeding feature to their bedding grounds, they're, they're going to move with a purpose. And so they're just moving and rolling country and your job is to keep with them. So these elk start moving and start rolling country and right before they bed, they'll kind of stop moving and they'll just start feeding around where they're going to bed. This is a great opportunity to kill a bull. So I start shadowing the herd and I start following them in through there and all of a sudden they go around this ridge and this ridge I can make it to, all the elk disappear and so this is my all in moment. I've got a great wind and I make my approach and I come over the top and here's this bull and he's rutting a cow. Now, when, when you're stalking elk, Again, it's these instincts, and it, you, you have to be clutch in these moments because these are the moments that count. And so when you're moving in on an elk, it, it, it's all about the speed at which you move in. And, it, and this goes for calling, this goes for stalking, whatever the case. You're going to hear a bu bull bugle. you got to know when to slow down. So you're working towards this elk and you're moving close. And when you think you're getting close enough, you need to slow down. And, and in the, the, the last few yards, this is when you need to be your slowest, the hands of the clock. You need to catch that elk before he catches you. You have to see them first. And so you're always going to be coming over a ridgeline. Like ridgeline assaults um, are, are usually uh, the most standard method of, of relocating those elk. So you see them, they go around a ridge, they go over a ridge. Now you've got to go over that ridge and you've got to see them before they see you. So when I'm walking over a ridge line, you know, I'm taking a step and I'm exposing a little bit more country and then I'm glassing. And, and don't get too focused on where they were. You got to make sure you're looking left and right. Like, like it happens all the time where you think that bull's right there and you come over the top and a cow or a satellite bull spots you to the right. So as you're coming over this ridge line, you really got to look left and right. Now, your whole body and everything in your being is going to be screaming at you to get over that ridge line and get that shot. Hurry up and cut off that bull. You know, that's the time to fight that. Like you need to move slow and controlled. You need to see those elk before they see you. So as I come over that ridge line, I'm taking a step every time. Now, I've seen guys too that will crawl to the edge of the ridge line and come over the top. There's no need for it. No matter if you're crawling, no matter if you're, you're belly crawling, no matter if you're walking, you still have to expose your head first over that ridge line. So I'll just walk and I'll come in low and then I'll come up and I'll expose myself over this ridge line. And I'll look left and I'll look right. Got to catch them first. Got to keep the element of surprise. After I don't see anything, couple more steps, couple more steps, couple more steps. And then you adapt to the situation at which you're given. Like a lot of times moving in on these elk, I can't tell you how many times like I've got stuck where I start moving in and all of a sudden the bull's on the other side of the cows. I got no shot, but there's cows right there that can see me if I move. Like now I'm just going to hold still. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to wait for this situation to develop. And even if I have to wait for him to move off, like the most important part of this is to keep the element of surprise. These elk, they're just going to go on being elk if they don't know you're there. And this, this is what really like, like changed it for me was, was stalking these elk. So I, I used to go into these mountains, into these wildernesses, and I'd, I'd call after these elk. And, and a lot of times... When guys are calling, they're getting an interaction from these bulls. And this interaction, it's exciting. It's thrilling. They're calling back to you. You have one located. You can hear them bugling back. And every time you bugle, they bugle. You get this adrenaline rush from it. 
So, so you start chasing these elk, but a lot of times these elk, they just know that they're being pressured and know that they're being hunting, hunted and they're gathering up their cows and they're moving away from you. They're bugling at their cows to get them out of there, to get them away from you, to get them away from this human pressure. Elk are where humans aren't. So being able to spot and stalk these things, like I'm still able to, to take part in this rut. I'm still able to take part in this excitement. They just don't know I'm there. They're just elk being elk. Like they're so much more susceptible. You ever notice when you call a bull in, these bulls, they come in on pins and needles. Like they come in and you're set up. I mean, you even go to draw your bow and they see you. Like they'll see everything. They'll see any movement. They come in on pins and needles. And so I was calling in these elk and doing a bunch of elk hunting, but I I noticed I was calling in a bunch of satellite bulls. So I wasn't calling in the big herd bull that I really wanted to target. I also noticed that they came in in pins and needles, so I wasn't getting a shot the majority of the time. They'd come in facing me, looking for me, you know, and then I wouldn't get a shot as they turn and go. And the one thing that really changed my mind is I, 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 I hiked into this wilderness drainage and I got in there and I glassed up this beautiful seven point. I mean, like this one, like giant seven by seven, you know, with his cows down and through there. And he's in this isolated wilderness basin. He hasn't had any hunting pressure. So, so I play my calling game where I'm going to get in and I'm going to make, get in close to the herd and I'm going to make a few cow calls. And I get in there close and I get set up. They have no idea I'm there. And you, 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 start making a couple cow calls, right? And, and all of a sudden I see this bull and he's bugling back at me. And all of a sudden he's taking all his cows and he's going all out of this drainage. So this dream bull that I had worked so hard to locate, putting in all these miles and all this effort, finally got him located, got in and made a few cow calls. I let him know I, I was there and he took his cows and he got the heck out of there. Like remember these bulls that were trying to hunt, they're five, six, seven years old. They've been through multiple hunting seasons. They've been called at. And not that you can't call in a bull like this, but I'll tell you a bull like that is only going to be in the right mood and have the right attitude maybe once a year. Maybe you catch those couple days where you got that bull in that right mood and he wants to come fight you or he wants to come gather up some more cows and he comes and checks you out. But the majority of time, he's going to gather up those cows and he's going to avoid you. So I chased these elk out of that drainage and that was the moment where I was like, no more. I'm, I'm not going to let these things know I'm there. And, and for a while, I'd still have my calls in my pocket, but I'd resort back to it. I'd get desperate. The elk would move off and oh, I'll make a couple calls, you know. I'd chase more elk out. And, and with this, this elk hunting, like creative thinking is rewarded. Sometimes you can use that against them. Sometimes I'll work in a drainage and I'll be hunting with a buddy and, and he really wants to call. Like he loves to call elk. Like that's what he does and how he hunts them. Well, that's fine. Just give me about 20 minutes I'm going to go work to their escape route. Then you go after that bull and start calling. It's amazing like these elk will just start to vacate this drainage and they're going to come towards these escape routes, these low saddles, uh, these places on these ridgelines. So you can play it with a buddy just like that. Like creative thinking is rewarded. Also called in bulls with scraping branches on trees, making noises, tipping rocks. Like uh, I've been walking through the forest and had bulls just come check me out because they thought I was a cow just from the noises of rolling rocks I was making. Creative thinking is rewarded. I heard Remy tell me one time, like he told me he takes his, his elk bladder or his, his water bladder um, and he takes his mouthpiece off and, and then he squirts his water bladder on the ground like he's an elk pissing. <laughs> That's like one of his tactics he uses. Like creative thinking is rewarded, something that nobody else has thought about. Splashing around in water. You know, all these things. It can bring a bull in without ever making a sound. But creative thinking is rewarded. Thinking outside the box. Like us as humans, like our biggest advantage is our brains. Some of us more than others. (laughs) But, um, you know, it's our ability to theorize. It's our ability to think, to outwit our quarry. Like, we're not the fastest out there. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we definitely don't have teeth and claws. You know, we use these weapons. But our, our, our best asset is our ability to theorize, our ability to think. And thinking outside the box is rewarded. So when you see these elk or you find these elk, come up with a creative solution. So this works really good with a buddy that wants to call after him. You just split up and you go cover those escape routes. And a lot of times, you know, maybe he gets a chance and he calls one of those bulls in or calls one of those satellite bulls in. 
but maybe he chases that herd and they go towards that escape route and there you are. So creative thinking is rewarded on these elk. Uh, I, I love to, to spot and stalk these things. Um, like when it's elk just being elk, gosh, they're so relaxed. You can get away with so much. It's amazing. You know, and a lot of times these elk, you're, you're, you're trying to beat these elk at, at, you're trying to beat multiple sets of eyes. So you're not just trying to beat that bull. You're trying to, to beat the 30 cows he's with. And again, you have to adapt to the situation you're given. You may get over there and the situation isn't right. Like the longer you can play the game, the better chance you have of that bull making a mistake. So, so I just want to move with them. Once I find elk, like that's a difficult part of this whole game. I just want to move with these elk. You know, other, other creative methods of, of locating elk I'll use, you can see elk from a long ways off. They have these big bleach blonde bodies, at least these bulls, and the cows do too. Like, it's amazing how far you can glass them. Like, I, I've sat at my house where I live, and I've glassed across my valley that's 26 miles, and I can see elk coming out on a feature. I can actually drive over there and go hike up and go get on these elk. Like, you can glass elk from a long ways. Now, 26 miles is pushing the limit. But 10 miles? No, it's not. Now, you can't, you can't judge a bull from that far, but you can see a group of cows and you can see a bull. And again, elk like being around other elk. So if you can just locate elk, you can get on them. So a lot of days, like I, I'm usually hiking to these different places and in these different drainages every day, but some days I'll just take a day off and I'll sit 10 miles down from the range and I'll sit and I'll glass from afar up on all these spots. And it's amazing. Pretty soon you'll turn up some elk. So instead of just wandering aimlessly, like now I've got a direction, I've got elk located up there. You know, thinking outside the box is rewarded. Also like uh, uh, during snowfall, like well, you, I don't know if you guys get much snow down here in Arizona, but up north we get a lot of snow up there. And um, you know, when it snows like that, I actually know where the elk push out to. Like, like this is one of my big, biggest secrets is knowing where the winter range is from hunting horns on the winter range, seeing these bulls come out on the winter range. And so when I get a big snow in the mountains, it pushes all these elk to this winter range and nobody knows that they're there. And I do. So I'll show up in these spots. Again, this elk hunting is timing as well. And I told this story about my biggest bull and uh, about not finding elk uh, for five days in these different places and how elements can change. But, but also timing is important on these elk. I find that where I find elk like in one drainage in one time of year, say uh, I've got a spot that I hunt September 5th. And the rut on these elk, it really ebbs and flows. They come in and out of it as these cows come in and out of estrus. Okay, and so, and they don't all rut at the same time. You can have one group of elk here that aren't rutting at all, aren't making any calls, and you go 10 miles down the range and they're going absolutely bonkers. But, but these elk, this rut, this, it, it, it really ebbs and flows. And it ebbs and flows all the way from September 5th to, I, I've killed my last handful of bulls in October. I think that one last year I killed the 28th, 22nd of September, but uh, I'd say probably six out of my last 10 bulls I kill in October because they give us an October season in Montana. And again, this is this creative thinking with my game plan. Everybody takes their elk vacation during the third and fourth week of September every single year. Those dates are great. But if I wait till October, everybody's taking all their vacation time. Nobody's in the mountains anymore. These elk are still rutting. These cows come in the second cycle estrus. So if they don't get bred the first time, they get bred in October. A month later, 30 days later, they go into this cycle. So they rut hard in October. And there's nobody in the mountains. I have it all to myself. Like it's magic. Also timing that, that early season as well. Like that early season is when those bulls don't have cows. So those bulls are looking for cows. It's where they're more susceptible to a cow call. You know, so sometimes not planning these peak dates and planning around them is creative thinking. Like one of our biggest challenges nowadays is, is hunting pressure as well. So this is a great way to beat it. Also, like uh, uh, for years, uh, I was such a weekend warrior. Like I started this construction business and I think I start this construction business and I'm gonna have all this free time. And I found out I have less free time because I got more responsibility. So as a weekend warrior, so say I can take 10 days off a season you know, I may not take that whole 10 days during the peak of the rut. What I may do is I may take two days for every weekend. You know, and, and a lot of these tags, they're short seasons where you're forced to take that amount of time. I get it. 
But, but Montana, we get a six-week season. So instead of taking all this 10 days off, I'll add a Thursday, Friday, or I'll add a Friday, Monday to the weekend. And I'll go hunt four days really hard and then come back. Nowadays, I have the luxury of more time. I, you know, I'll take the weekend days off. You all hunt during the week. There's less pressure during the week. So this, this thinking outside the box, this, this theorizing and making game plans, like it's so important to, to getting into these elk and killing these elk. So there's, there's, um, the, the snowstorms, uh, also what I'll do too is when it snows real good on these mountaintops is I won't be glassing for elk so much, but I can be glassing for elk tracks. I can see where they come out and where they feed and where they put away in the timber. Now I know some elk are there. Again, these elk are nomadic. Well, they're, they're not spread out throughout the mountain range. They're in select locations and they're nomadic and they're moving those locations. We're trying to find a moving target. So we've got to be nomadic with them. We've got to move with them. Once we, once we locate these elk, like, like moving in on them, it, it's tough to know. It's not black and white. So like I say, I like to rely upon my instincts and adapt to the situation. So as I move in or as I find these elk, I may be tailing these elk, and, and I like to hunt them in their feeding feature. I'll hunt a, a bull in his bed, but I got to know his exact location. If I'm just going in, like they like to bed in the thickest cover, in the thickest timber. And, and if I'm going to go into that bedroom with 30 sets of eyes or 60 sets of eyes, I want to know exactly where every one of those elk are. So if I can glass them from the opposing face of the canyon and all of a sudden I can see that bull bedded, now I've got a chance. Now I'll stalk him in his bed. I'll try to stalk into that position and, and be slow and precise and methodical, hunt them like a mule deer in there. But the majority of times I'm hunting elk and their feeding features. So, so the best chance to kill them is when they're out and they're just feeding and they're just grazing. When you can read those mannerisms of the elk, use the topography to get in close. And so like if I'm chasing a bull in the morning, I'm keeping that element of surprise. I'm not gonna blow them up. I'm also not gonna stalk to failure. Like I'm not just gonna stalk until I blow up the elk. I'm gonna freeze and hold up back. I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stay a couple hundred yards away from them and wait for my all-in moment to go in where I really feel like I can kill that bull. And again, it just comes down to your instinct. When you look at a situation and you go, I think I can kill that bull. Like that's your all in moment. And, and you have to be decisive in these moments. Like you can sit and you can wishy-washy back and forth and you know, maybe I'll do this or maybe I'll do that. But, but it seems to me like when I'm making decisions quick, I'm relying upon my instincts, I'm making quality moves. And so like I may chase an elk all morning long once he puts away in this dark timber, all of a sudden, I know kind of where he's bedded, or I know the timber that he's bedded, I'm not going to go in after him. I'll sit there all day, and I'll wait for him to come out in the evening, wait for him to come out in this feeding features again, when I can see all the elk, and I can make a move on him in there. The, the evening is such a great time to kill a bull. The evening is when those thermals will switch around, and they'll start coming downhill. So mule deer, I like to hunt in the middle of the day when I can come from above and use those uphill thermals. Elk, I like to come from below and use those downhill thermals. I like to use them in the, in the, the evening and first thing in the morning. So I'll wait. I'll wait for these elk to come out into their feeding features, not give myself away, keep my element of surprise. So that, that biggest bull I kill, you know, I told you guys about hunting that thing for two days. I killed another bull last year, a 331, this great bull with these great big fronts. You'll probably see them on here. Um, that bull I hunted for three days. Now, I did bust that bull. I busted him the first time I saw him. I saw my all-in moment on the evening, and, and I ran down to go get into him, slowed down my pace. Uh, again, it's, it's knowing when to slow down. A lot of times when these elk are moving, like, I'll be jogging to try to keep up to him because they just went over a rise, and I'll make it to that rise, and I'll just barely catch him going over the next rise over there. I'm trying to follow him and chase him. So, so it's like knowing when to slow down and in these situations when you're gonna run into these elk. So sometimes I'm jogging. When I get close, I'm moving like the hands of the clock. Again, when I'm doing my ridgeline assaults and I think there's gonna be an elk there, I'm moving really slow. It's knowing when to slow down. And it's also reading these bugles. Like just because I'm not calling back and forth, these elk are still rutting, they're still bugling. I'm still using this bugle as a locate. Like half the time I'm seeing the elk that I'm chasing and half the time I'm hearing the bull that I'm chasing. 
all of a sudden he'll cut out another bugle and it's about trying to, to echolocate where that bugle came from in that location. So as I hear him and he went over the rise and I can tell that bugle's over the rise, now I know I need to hustle to get over that rise. And, and uh, when you're listening to these bugles, you gotta be careful here too, like they can trick you. Like the direction that they're facing it is, is the direction that bugle comes from. So if they're bugling right at you, they're gonna sound really close. If they're bugling away from you, they're gonna sound farther away. And guys, I've, I've made every mistake in the book. Like to be a successful bow hunter, you have to be really good at failing. I don't get it right on all these elk. I make a lot of mistakes. I bust elk. I create opportunities, but I learn from it and I get better. I'm always trying to improve and, and evolve my hunting skills. So when I show up at the trailhead, I am undeniable. I know that I can go in there. I can go locate elk. I know once I locate elk, I can make smart plays on them. I know once I make smart plays, I can execute my shot on them. And so like uh, hunting these elk, like, like it's really building your skill set. And hunting elk is gaining experience. The more you hunt elk, the better you're going to get at it. So I know they've got super premium tags here in Arizona. It's not about drawing a, big, a good tag and killing a 400-inch bolt. You haven't bit the, built the skill set to go in there and kill that bull. Like, sure, it might happen. I don't like relying upon luck. Like, success odds in my general units that I hunt run 6% for a bull elk. 6% success rates with a bow and arrow for a bull elk. That's one in 20. So you're telling me one in every 20 years I'm going to be successful on a bull elk. I, I don't accept those odds. I want to build my skill set to where, you know, I'm 100% or as close as I can get to it. Now, now, shooting at these elk, I'm the same way when I'm trying to get a shot at a bull. So bulls are big targets. We're all excited, but they're not. Elk are the toughest animals out there. It's got to be lungs, heart, or liver, or they don't die. And you're in for heartache. It can ruin your entire season. Have to be patient, waiting for the right shot, waiting for the right angle. These, these bows are, are extremely lethal, but only when you put those arrows in the right spot. So when you're hunting these elk, it's really waiting for your right moment. It's not trying to force an arrow into a bunch of brush. You'll hit a limb, I guarantee it. I hit, I've hit a bunch of them. Like you can't force it. You also can't force a bad angle. I mean, elk for me, you can kill an elk uh, uh, head on, frontal shot. But man, he's gotta be close. I don't take that shot. I, I just, my elk season means too much for me to notch an elk tag on an, on an empty elk tag on an elk that got away. So I'm waiting for the perfect shot. I've just seen too many bad situations and bad scenarios go down with myself, with my family, with my buddies that I know. I've learned my lesson. Like a lot of us guys, we don't learn lessons the easy way. We learn them the hard way by making big mistakes and regretting it for an entire year, waiting for an entire year for redemption on these elk. So I wait for the right moment. I wait for a broadside elk. I wait for a quartering away elk. I wait for a good shot that I know I can make and I make a precise shot. It has to be that way. It's not just getting an arrow into these elk. They are the toughest animals on planet earth. Lungs, heart, or liver and they die. Anywhere else, you got a 10% chance to get them. Maybe you hit a femoral. Maybe you hit an artery. Maybe you hurt them bad where you can get another arrow. But I mean, they'll carry a gut shot for miles. They're tough animals. So you gotta be really patient when you're looking for your shot, when you're waiting for your right angle. And then you have to sit on your shot. The, 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 the worst bad habit, or at least my worst bad habit, and the, and the worst one that I've seen with guys shooting at animals is we get so excited, we throw our, our pin, just hits the fur where we wanna hit, and we punch that trigger off. Like a good shot takes another second. Let that pin float there. Just take that extra second. This is the moment you've been waiting for. Like we're almost in this situation and, and we, we want this shot so bad that we want to get this shot off whether we hit the bull or not. We just want to get it off. We just want to get this shot. But, but it's about just taking that extra second. So when I'm drawing my bow, I'm paying attention to all these elk. I'm paying attention to where they're looking. So um, I'm going to wait for this bull to have his head down feeding or when he's looking away or when I don't have any of the elk on me when I try to draw my bow. Uh, range finding is a huge skill that nobody talks about. So many times I've got a bad range off the grass or a quick range. Like I'll range that thing five, six, seven times. I want to know I have the right range. When I draw back, I'm going to have none of these elk looking at me and I'm going to draw slow. 
And, and when I'm shooting elk, a common mistake I see is that guys will draw their bow and try to walk around the tree to get a shot. These big movements, they spook animals. Animals will put up with slow, little movement. They, they will not put up with big movement. So there's no stand up quick. There's no step around a tree after you're drawn. Like you need to get yourself into position slowly and then draw your bow as slow as you can. Now, sometimes these elk are gonna know you're there. The gig's up, you're busted. The elk are on to you. There, there's no waiting. Like sometimes an elk will see me, one lone cow will see some movement and I'll freeze. And I may have to stay there for 15 minutes and she may forget about me and put her head down and go back. And, and I've still got my element of surprise. She doesn't know I'm there. But sometimes you just know when they're on to you. All the elk are looking up. The gig's busted. Like, like you know it's either now or never and the bull's standing there broadside. In those moments, I'm also gonna try to draw my bow. Elk don't jump strings. They wait on the arrow. So I'm gonna move extremely slow. Nothing is fast here. And I'm gonna try to draw my bow slow and then I'm gonna try to execute a good shot. Like you can get away with this on elk. So I'm gonna be really patient. I'm gonna look for this right angle and I'm gonna put this precise shot into an elk. And when you shoot an elk, it's kind of like getting into a car crash. You don't really remember what happened or where the elk went. There's just all this excitement that surrounds this situation and, and, and that, you, that you just had yourself in. So right now is the time to, to, to pay attention to the details. You hit that elk, you take that shot on that elk. Pay attention to where that elk runs. Stand in your exact location. Remember where the elk was standing. Remember which way he ran. Remember the last meadow you saw him through, the direction he was. Listen for falling sticks. Listen for anything have to be CSI. Like this is, you have to unfold this crime scene that you just created to unlock where your bull went. And bulls can run a long way, even with a lethal shot. Like the blood trail leads to the elk. Once you start circling around in grid patterns, like, yeah, you may find them, but majority of elk that I get, like you blood trail them down. Got to be able to CSI, not get your foot tracks in there in his tracks. Like a lot of times you can read this 700 pound elk track that are going down in the dirt as they go downhill. Like, like you can read the blood drips that come off of it. And, and you follow it and, and, and recover your bull. The blood trail leads to the bull. So pay attention to these details. After you shoot, pay attention to where that elk ran, which direction he ran. You gotta be able to blood trail this thing down. And, and if you just lose it like a car wreck and all of a sudden you, you run over here to get a look at the bull and you forget where you were standing, forget where the bull was standing, didn't see which direction he ran. Now you're starting from square one. You got no information to go on. It's gonna be a lot tougher. And, and sometimes when you hit these elk, it's gonna take them 10, 20, 30 steps to start bleeding. Like their cavity has to fill up. So pay attention to these details. Like it may make the difference between getting this bull and not getting this bull, not getting that bull. So I, I, I love hunting these elk. They are the most thrilling animal to hunt. And, and when you can get into them and be into them, like, like that is the funnest. Like the action is the funnest. But it takes all these, these skill sets. It takes working hard throughout the year, getting everything right with your, your family life and your home life so you can have the time to go. I take care of all my work. Like right now, that's the biggest deal for me, getting ready for September. I've got some August hunts coming up. It's just making sure I've got all my work taken care of, that my family's good, that I've taken care of my responsibilities. And, and then it's putting in the work. Like, like the key to consistent success, it, you know, that. You, you're going to fail. You got to be resilient. You know, resilience, this, this mental fortitude, this keep pushing. Like you're going to hit ebbs and flows and highs and lows in this hunt. You're going to get down. You're going to have times where you can't find these elk. You just got to be this, this constant motivational force to just go, man, I, I've been waiting all year for this September. I'm going to give it all I got. Like, yeah, there may not be elk here. Or maybe there's hunters here but you know what, I still got a couple days. I'm gonna go check out this drainage that I've got on my, my, my game plan C or my game plan D. I'm gonna go check out this drainage. The, the pain of going home early and giving in, like say you plan seven days for a hunt and you go home day five, those two days are miserable. Like that pain, 
That, that pain that, that I endure in those two days that I'm back home and it doesn't take too long and you're back in your normal life and you're getting tap water out of the sink and you're sitting on your comfy couch and the only thing you can think about is being back in the mountains and giving up early. But, but when you're in the mountains, it's gonna be these trying times. Like a lot of the country I hunt is grizzly bear country. I'm gonna run into grizzly bears. I run into rattlesnakes. I run into gnarly storms. I run into snow, wind, rain, like you name it, I'm gonna have to face it. But the more we put into these hunts, the more we're able to endure, the more it means to us in the end. This is the type two fun. You know, type one fun is riding a roller coaster. You don't sit at night and dream about your type one fun. You dream about that type two fun, that putting everything into a hunt, all your preparation, all your physical fitness. And, and at this point, when I'm on a hunt, I mean, I put 365 days and heck, I put 20 years into structuring my life to get as much time as I can to go enjoy what I love to do. Think I'm gonna go home two days early? No freaking way. You know, so you build up and you put that work in and it means more in the end. Like the reason we love this is because of the challenge, because of how tough it is. Like sometimes even when I'm into elk, it feels like mission impossible. But I can't tell you how many times that I've pushed to the last day and I've killed a great six point the last day. Or I've killed a great bull with two days left of the hunt. It's just amazing how you keep putting forth effort and you keep trying to create these opportunities that eventually they come to fruition. But you put in that work. We've got a month left to season. Like this is where we need to be hitting the maps and hitting our e-scouting, making our game plans. Scouting for elk is a touch different. Like scouting, elk aren't, where, where, are, where bulls are now is not where they're gonna be in September. Where the cows are now might be where the bulls are in September. Like the cows are gonna be in lush feeding areas now. Like it's good to go scout elk numbers right now. And then when I'm scouting, I'm also, you know, I'm just getting a lay of the land. I'm learning trailheads. I'm learning road systems. Elk, when I'm scouting, another very important piece to this, it, it, you know, I mentioned that elk are where humans aren't. It's, it's finding these zones of pressure. Like, like I take a map and I take every road and I mark a mile at either side of the road and this is where I'm not hunting. Sure, there can be elk here, but there's gonna be people here and, and most likely this isn't where the biggest bulls are gonna be and this is not gonna be where the elk end up. Also, I take a trailhead. Everybody loves to park at the end of a road. You get to a trailhead there, you know, there, there's multiple vehicles. Everybody's leaving from this trailhead. Everybody's going up these trails. I'll mark two miles or even three miles around a trailhead and I won't hunt any of that spot. So I can start taking this map and I can start marking uh, a mile from either road, three miles around every trailhead, drawing a big circle around it. These are the areas that I can just cross off my list. These are the areas that I am not hunting. Sure, there can be elk in there, but these aren't the, the areas that I'm gonna focus on. What I want is I want isolated drainages. Uh, you know, humans are lazy by nature. I want the places that take effort. People also love to hunt uphill and then come back downhill to their trucks. Nobody likes to go hunt downhill and have to come uphill to their truck. So I'll dive in the biggest, deepest hole I can find. And usually there's elk in there. Elk are where humans aren't. So if you can identify these zones of pressure, like you can make a really solid game plan for these elk. So that's what we need to be working on right now. We need to be working on our game plan, working on our scouting, working to, to get our days off that we need to get to go chase these elk around. Working on our shooting, being ready for our moment. I walk around the woods. I, oh, I've got my string in my pocket because I couldn't shoot my bow today. And I carry my release in my pocket. So I walk around getting ready for my opportunity. I've shot at enough animals that I know how tough it is to, to be able to put a precise shot on an animal. And I know that I have to, uh, I, I wanna make a controlled shot. I don't wanna put my pin on that animal and jerk my trigger. That's the, that's the worst uh, move I can make on an animal. So I know for me that I need to work on my execution. The difference between a good shot and a bad shot for me is one second, that's all. But it's getting a hold of my mind. So it's having this elk and having this shot process. So I walk around my entire hunt. I walked around today and I hook my release up to my string. I say, draw back, put the pin where I want it, pull, 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 shot breaks. Over and over and over again, throughout my hunt, I'm readying myself for my moment because I know it's gonna come. I know I'm gonna create it. 
I ready myself for that moment so I can be clutch. Got to be clutch in, in this bow hunting world. And that goes for your stocks, like not rushing things, not making mistakes. And that goes on your shot. Focus on this execution because your chance will come at that giant bolt. So we're going to take a short intermission here, guys. Going to get back up. We'll do 20, 30 more minutes and then do a question answer and um, wrap this thing up. So thanks a bunch, guys. I appreciate it. Guys, we're going to take a quick break. It's going to be short and fast, guys. Brian's still got a lot of information to get to you. The silent auction stuff, it is going to end at 9 o'clock. If you've been involved with the bidding on that, you're going to uh, get a notification right before 9 o'clock. It's going to be cut off. We're not going to do a countdown or anything. The Big Ten raffle and stuff, that's going to end at 9 o'clock as well. So if you want to get tickets for that stuff, get them now. We're going to try to end, uh, have Brian done like real close to 9 o'clock, but in, in about 5, 10, very 10 minutes at the very most, we're going to get rolling again and do a short segment with Brian, and then it's going to go to questions and answers and the people that are uh, – in the audience that like to ask questions, we're going to actually have a mic up here in the front. You can come up and ask the questions uh, on the mic to Brian.
Check, check. Hey, guys, we're going to get rolling here in just a couple minutes. Anybody wants to uh, come back in for the presentation, Brian's going to get started again. He's going to do a 20-minute session, and then we are going to go to questions and answers. So uh, you guys want to get back into the main sanctuary, and we're going to get rolling here in just a couple of minutes. That is not my identity.
Everybody, thanks for coming tonight. It's been a great presentation so far. Got 20 minutes, and then we're going to go to questions and answers. So if you got some questions and answers, we'll call you up from the audience. You can actually come up here and ask Brian some stuff. Let's roll. Thank you, sir. Yep. All right. Back on. So I uh, had a conversation like after I, I got off stage here and, and just reminded me, you know, I'm, I'm so into chasing these things with a bow and getting close. And, and, and really the reason I've had so much bow hunting success is committing to it. Like, uh, you know, I, uh, when I first started elk hunting, it was any elk hunting I can get. And, and experience is a huge key for learning, guys. Like, like there's no substitute for experience and learning from these encounters. So I know tags are tough to get here in Arizona, but there's over-the-counter opportunities. Idaho will sell you tags over-the-counter. Montana's got a general season. Wyoming has a general season. Over-the-counter, like Colorado's close to you guys. The more you hunt elk, the better you'll get at it. The, the more experience you have elk, the better you'll get at it. And, and it takes like going through these tough times. It, again, it takes failure, failure. It takes resilience of continuing to push forward. But make sure you're taking advantage of these elk tags. Like for me, I fell in love with chasing elk and hunting elk, and I'm fortunate. I get a tag every year in Montana, an over-the-counter tag. It cost me $30. But elk hunting's tough. Again, my success odds run at 6%. It's not easy. But I get to go hunt elk every single year. So take advantage of these opportunities and, and even, you know, saving your points. Like I say, to go into the, one of these places that takes a lot of points to draw, you got to have the skill set to go in there and be successful. And, and bulls look big on the hoof. <laughs> they look twice as big when they're standing there looking at you than they do on the, when they're on the ground. You know, they're giants. So, so you got to work at all these skill sets of finding these and stalking these elk being able to locate them, being able to e-scout. And the more places that you can hunt and learn, the, the better you're going to get. Like when you can take these, these skill sets and apply it to different habitats. For me, for different species. Like, like my stalking skill, you know, it didn't just come from hunting elk. It comes from all this experience of stalking mule deer. I, I just got back from hunting Hawaii like four or five days ago, hunting axis deer, stalking axis deer. That really helps with my, my still hunting and my stalking skills, executing shots. Hunting antelope. Antelope are like this, um, uh, at, at least where I'm at. See, I can get an antelope tag every year as well. But these antelope, where I'm at, they're high, uh, high percentage, or not high percentage, but high opportunity. Like you can always find an antelope and where I might get five stalks in a whole elk season, I can get five stalks a day on antelope. But, but antelope are really crafty. Like they're really good at catching you and they live in open terrain. So even though I get a bunch of chances, I get to fail a lot. I get to try out these stalking skills, using the ungulation, getting the wind right, like making these small movements, everything that I'm talking about, I get to practice it. That goes into my hunting instincts and will we'll pay dividends on elk. So, so maybe you can't hunt elk every year, but, but they do give you an over-the-counter tag because I take advantage of it down here in January, like over-the-counter mule deer, over-the-counter coos. I think coos, uh, success with a bow runs around 3% or something crazy. Like those things are gnarly. I, I got hooked on hunting those for about five years like... Um, Man, you get a bunch of opportunities on them. You find really good bucks. Like all this plays into our skill set. This is all building our skill set. So when you show up or when you do draw that tag, you know, you can set your sights higher. Like on these elk, I've seen some of my buddies make mistakes to set their sights too high at first. Maybe they killed a giant one with a rifle and they want a giant one with a bow. So they, you know, and, and scores are all inflated on elk, guys. Like that, that biggest bull I killed, he's my first bull that breaks 350. Majority of my big bulls are 320 to 350, right in there. That's a giant bull for me. This bull over here scores 340. Seven point with huge thirds outside the rack. Huge back end. Like this is a giant bull. It's a 340 bull. Everybody likes to over-exaggerate their elk by about 30 inches. You know, in comparison is the thief of all happiness. Don't compare yourself. We're all in our own journey. 
Like I tell you guys about devoting my life to this elk hunting journey I'm on, like, like this has been a, a 22 year journey for me. That's where I'm at uh, of doing everything in my power to be the very best elk hunter I can be for 22 years. I'm in a different place in my journey than most other people. I can set my sights a little bit higher. But you know, think too, when you're, when you're looking at an Instagram feed, you're looking at somebody's highlight reel. Don't compare yourself to other people. You're in your own journey. Fall in love with the process, not the results. You know why I'm good at elk hunting? Because I love to elk hunt. I love preparing for elk hunting. I love elk hunting. I love everything about it. I love being in the mountains. Like, like that's my game. It wasn't that I fell in love with the results. I fell in love with the process. I fell in love with preparing for it, putting in the work, putting in the effort. God, I heard this great quote the other day. I always screw up really good sayings and quotes. It's like, uh, I screw them up on the podcast all the time, but let's see if I can remember this one. So it was, uh, lazy people put in a little bit of work and expect success. Successful people work tirelessly and, and always worry that they're being lazy. I'm always worrying that I'm not putting in enough work. That's what's gonna get you there. Discipline, dedication, hard work. It's taking a look at yourself and finding your weakness and working on that weakness. We all like to work on our strengths. If we're a great shooter, we love to shoot. If we're really strong, we like to lift weights. And I get caught in this too. Like I, I have, um, I've taught myself to learn to love to run. And I, uh, it's the way I prepare for the mountains and I, I get my discipline out of this. But you know, where I really need it is like I'm a small guy, I'm killing 700 pound elk and a lot of times I'm packing them out by myself. Like I've gotta be strong. My weak point is my back. I've worked construction my whole life. Like, like sure, I can make excuses or I can work to get that stronger. So for me, the tough thing is working on the weights, being disciplined, making sure I'm getting that in each and every week, doing my body weights, my kettlebells, my pull-ups, my push-ups, being strong so when I kill that bull, I can break him down by myself and I can get him out of country. We gotta work on our weaknesses. If we're overweight, we gotta take some weight off. We gotta look at ourselves. You wanna be the best elk hunter out there, you gotta work on all these different strengths and weaknesses. So, so it's really applying yourself to these and, and working on that mental toughness. That mental toughness, that's what's gonna carry you through to the finish line. And, and mental toughness, like it, it's not, it's not, it's really tough to put your thumb on. Like how do you gain mental toughness? I wanna be strong, I, I wanna have mental fortitude. And you hear professional athletes and you ask them how much of their game is mental and they'll tell you 90%. They'll tell you 100%. Now, some of these, these athletes are absolutely gifted. I get it. But if they think mental is that important like to their sport, it's just as important to us. So adding this mental toughness and this mental fortitude through our training. And, and how do we gain mental toughness? Through, through facing adversity and finding our way through the other side. And... and and courage isn't, you know, courage isn't being uh, uh, so strong-minded that you're never afraid of anything. Courage is being afraid of something and facing it anyways. Going through it anyways. Like, we have to be courageous. It's going to take a lot of effort. We're going to hurt. We're going to want to stop hiking these miles. We're going to want to stop hiking up. We're going to, you know, it's really easy to come home. And even if you draw a good tag, it's really easy to make an excuse why you didn't fill that tag. Oh, there was too much hunting pressure. The elk weren't rutting this year. They, oh, I, I couldn't find them. Or you can keep pushing. Don't allow yourself these excuses. Keep putting in this effort. This mental toughness and making it through these trying times, that's how you gain layers on this mental toughness. And then once you go through these tough hunts and maybe you felt like giving in day five, but you pushed it all the way till the end, till day 10, maybe even added an extra day, you hunted 11 days. You can go home with your head held high. Like I know on a hunt, if I gave it my all, even if I come up uh, uh, unsuccessful, the hunt's still a success to me. Fall in love with the process. Don't get so, so stuck on the results. Like enjoy it while we're out there. We work all year and we think about it all year long. Like, like you better enjoy being out there. And, and being successful or arrowing a big bull is a very small portion of elk hunting. That's not elk hunting in its entirety. Elk hunting in its entirety is an entire process of this training and preparing ourselves and going on these hunts and then being immersed in these hunts and giving it our all. 
Once we go on these tough hunts and we give it our all, we can draw from that mental toughness. We can think back to that. I, I've got so many tough hunts under my belt now where I know the, the last couple days I pushed and I arrowed the six point, I can draw from that. I can draw from training all year, making myself go out and run when it's 105 out right now or when it's 20 below and snowing. Like I can draw from that. That's how I add my mental toughness. And, and when I'm faced with a decision, uh, I, I choose the decision that's going to make me a better elk hunter, that's going to give me a chance at, at killing a bull. Like, I live for hunting elk with my bow and arrow. I think about it all year long. I think about it every single day. Every day I'm working to be a better elk hunter. That's why I'm successful is I love the process. As I was talking to a guy, like, after the seminar, I realized that we also are not all bow hunters. So I wanted to touch on rifle season. Maybe some of you guys have some rifle tags. The, these elk... It's the toughest time of year to hunt them in a late October tag or an early November tag, this post-rut hunt. This is a tough time to hunt them. Now, this goes for uh, a lot of you guys can draw that late archery tag here. That's an incredible tag. Like you get to hunt the best units and you get to hunt them for a fraction of the points and all those big bulls are still in there. Like sure, taking, taking part of this rut is really exciting and the rut hunts are what I live for, but if I can hunt elk, I'm gonna be hunting elk. So hunting this post-rut, uh, these bulls start to separate from these cows. They stop paying attention to them. The bigger bulls won't be with the cows anymore. Uh, the bigger bulls will start running solo, and then eventually they'll start running in bachelor crews. These bulls will start finding these isolated drainages. It's the same thing where they're finding places away from human pressure, but they're going to find this drainage and as it gets into the late season. Uh, I'm not using my mobile vantage point as much as I'm using a master vantage point. So I'm using my e-scouting and, and I'm picking apart country and I'm trying to find a high point that shows off an immense amount of country and then I'm making sure that I am there before daylight so when the sun comes up I can glass. These bulls, they'll tighten up their program as they get into this late October, early November and by tighten up their program, they're not gonna show themselves during much daylight hours. And, and when I first started hunting elk, like uh, to me, like I got hooked on hunting elk and it was with a bow or with the rifle, whatever the case. Now the last 16 years, it's been all bow, but I do hunt during this rifle season with my family uh, uh, and I'll also take part in it too with my bow and arrow in some of these late seasons. But uh, these bulls are gonna start to find these isolated drainages. They're gonna try, start to tighten up their program. They come out in smaller openings. Uh, they're going to come out in shoots and slides, small little green features where they're secluded in there. So getting these master vantage points, and, and you guys in Arizona are so good with your glass, like some of the best uh, in the whole country, because you guys tripod up your binos, you use bigger binos, you use the 15 buys. Now, you know, on elk, unless I'm look, looking over a long distance away, I usually my 10 buys will get it done for me. But yeah, if you can tripod up a binos from a master vantage point and you're looking a mile to three miles off, those 15s are gonna be a game changer. But sitting behind your glass from those master vantage point, turning up those elk, and then making a game plan to go kill them. Like I may be, say I'm on a vantage point now and everywhere I can see is elk country and I'm looking anywhere from 500 yards off to three miles off. Like to sit and to cover that much country at first light and last light is a game changer. So I'm gonna sit on that master vantage point. I'm gonna locate those elk and then I'm gonna make a game plan to try to kill them. Now, when, when I'm hunting with a rifle or when I was hunting with a rifle, same thing there, I'm trying to kill them in their feeding feature. So I'll sit in glass and I'll see where that elk puts away and watch him with my glass and then I know the timber he put away in. Now I'm gonna set myself up for the evening hunt trying, to, trying to, to figure out where he's gonna come out in that meadow or where he's gonna come feed that night and put myself in a position to either relocate that bull where I'm in striking distance where I can close in and get a shot or I'm gonna set myself up in a shooting position where I'm waiting for that bull to come back out. I'm gonna hunt him patiently. Same thing, I'm not gonna let these bulls know I'm hunting them. I'm gonna let them do their pattern and I'm gonna sit back with glass until I can dial it in and then put myself in the right position. So as it gets into this later season, these master vantage points are key. And, and there's nothing against a master vantage point during bow season as well. Uh, that, that bull that I, that I told you I killed, the first bull I killed last year, a 331, a great bull, um, 
I, I had chased this herd, uh, about killed this mudded up six point and uh, drew on him and he never stopped walking. And I had like 60, 70 cows crossing in front of me. I didn't get a shot. They went up and bugled and rutted that night. And then I went up and chased them the next morning and they went around this corner uh, and it was on this big 10,000 foot peak. So I kind of, uh, I had to wait for him to cross the corner, didn't let him know I was after him and made it to the top of this peak, but I was like late morning kind of glassing down into their bedding features down in there. And I couldn't really turn him up and it's getting late. And I'm on the top of a 10,000 foot peak and I'm maybe, I don't know, six, eight miles back or something. I think I was farther back from my truck and I actually came back towards my truck chasing these out. But uh, I'm, I'm quite a ways back in there. So I should have it all to myself. I'm in the mountains and all of a sudden I hear some bugles and I see two guys and they walk up to the same big 10,000 foot peak that I'm on. Nice guys, I introduce myself. And I've, I've actually kept in touch with one of them. But throughout that day, I saw 10 different guys make that, that ridge line, that 10,000 foot peak. Now that morning, I had a couple hundred elk around me that all disappeared in the timber. But there's so many guys that were, were hunting and bugling at these things in the timber. I don't know where they're at. So I'm gonna sit on this 10,000 foot peak and I'm gonna glass. I see 10 different guys make this 10,000 foot peak that day. I meet 10 different bow hunters up there. So I just stay up there and I find some shade underneath the tree and um, middle of the day, like I told you, I hunt them a lot at night and then I hunt morning and evening. Like you also got to take care of yourself. So I'm catching up on my sleep middle of the day. Like sure, I'll grab a vantage point in the middle of the day or if I know where some elk are that I'm sitting on, I'll sit on them all day. Uh, But I'm not putting a lot of effort into the middle of the day. It's just, you can't rule out country in the middle of the day. You can go in the best elk drainage. If all the elk are put away in the middle of the day, you can not glass an elk and rule this drainage out that may be full of elk. So middle of the day, I'm taking a nap below a tree. I introduce myself to 10 different bros up there, which I, I like hunting where I've got it all to myself. But these are where these elk were around this thing. And I stay up there. You know, nobody stayed up there for the day. I had enough water and could survive up there, but everybody hiked up to the top of that 10,000 foot peak and they had their comfy camp in the bottom. I had my camp on my back and, and, and they had 32 ounces of water. They sat up there for a couple hours glassing around in the middle of the day and they ended up going back down. Guess who was the only guy up there in the evening? Me. Everybody was gone. Everybody hiked up there. They ran out of water. They ran out of gusto, wanted to make it back down to their camp. Now I'm the only one sitting on that master vantage. I turned up the bull that I ended up killing. I turned him down up in a bottom, went for a stock on him. Uh, I ended up busting him. I had him in bow range. And again, he was quartered to me. I didn't have a good angle to shove an arrow in there, but I was right in bow range with my bow, right in front of me with a range on that bull. He just didn't give me the right angle. He walked into the trees, caught my wind. He blew out of there. I caught him two drainages over another day later or whatever. I ended up hunting that bull for three days before I finally arrowed him. But... But my point is, is like being at the right places at the right times. Uh, another, uh, I'm running out of time here, but one of, one of my biggest assets hunting elk and why I killed that bull is hunting with my camp on my back. Hunting this, this lightweight approach. Like you don't have all this effort going to and from camp. And everybody hunts for different reasons. Like for me, I want to push myself mentally and physically. I want to give it my absolute all and dang near kill myself trying to kill that elk. Like that's what I have fun doing. Some guys uh, like, a, like a good camp, like a cold beer, like a nice steak. I, I mean, I'm, I'm living off granola and I'm living back with the elk. I just want to go as hard as possible. But that's the cool thing is we're all individuals. We can all have our own experience. But traveling with your camp on your back is a game changer. So I like to go really light and I like to go on these three day assaults and I'll load up my backpack. I can usually get my backpack loaded up for around 30, 35 pounds for three days. Like I'm really light. Sometimes I'll bring my scope if I'm really looking for a trophy bull, but really most elk, 80%, you can get away with just your binos telling what they are, unless they're a long ways off. So I'll travel with my camp on my back and I've got this lightweight bivy tent. I've got my pad, I've got my sleeping bag and I'm bare minimum. A lot of times on these three day assaults, I don't even have a stove. Like I'm just going with uh, uh, dry foods. I'm going as light as possible and I'm hunting with my pack on my back and I'm camping with these elk or where I end up that night. It's highly effective. You don't have all this effort going to and from camp. Another one of my tricks I use, like using these e-bikes or using a motorbike. Like I've got this motorbike carrier on the back of my truck and a lot of times I'll through hunt places. So this comes back to my hunt plan. 
I'm going to scout this spot and I'm going to through hunt it. So I don't have to hike from my truck into elk country and then all the way back to my truck. Like that second half of that whole hunt is useless. I've already covered that ground. Like sure, you can maybe run into one where elk are moving or whatever. But instead, I'll drop my motorbike or drop my e-bike 15 miles down the range or 20 miles down the range and park at this trailhead and then I'll through hunt all the way through. I love to carry everything I need on my back. It's not this to and from camp, all this extra effort. I just camp where I end up. Now you definitely wanna, wanna be um, low impact on these elk. You don't wanna let them know you're hunting them. When I camp, uh, I'm not camping in the middle of the meadows. The meadows are where the elk have to feed at night and they're gonna work down. You don't want to give them your wind. You also know that your thermals drop at night into the drainages. So you want to hunt, you want to camp out of the drainage where the elk are. And then I like to get in the thick stuff. Now, I like to get in the thick stuff for two reasons, to uh, avoid the elk that are feeding in meadows and also to avoid grizzly bears. Like grizzly bears use the ridge lines and trails and use the open features to move through. They don't walk in the thick trees for much. So that's where I am. That's where I'll camp. But I think about these camping locations and and being able to travel and hunt with this camp on my back, even though it's 30, 35 pounds, it saves so much effort. You get to camp wherever you end up and camp in the elk and travel with them. If you don't find them, you keep moving. And then doing these through hunts where you're not hiking to and from, you're hiking all the way through. Again, elk are nomadic. If you wanna kill elk, you gotta be nomadic too. It's cover and country. So I'm sure I could sit up here and talk elk all night, but we wanna do like a question and answer for you guys. Uh, so what we're gonna do, we got a mic set up here. If you guys got any questions, come up and ask them and I'll do the best I can to try to answer them. Specific hunting questions, whatever you guys got. We also have some internet questions. So if we're bashful or shy, we can get those rolling too. Yeah, go ahead and come up and, and ask. That's okay. I can, I can oh, good, I can hear you. Yeah, um, talk about full moon. Full moon. Uh, I am not a moon guy. Uh, a lot of guys are moon guys and they believe it ties to the rut. A lot of guys uh, believe the, the equinox of the rut is the 19th. Uh, I don't put much emphasis in the moon. Like I know during a full moon, they can feed more at night. Uh, they can see more, but elk are active at night no matter what. They're rutting at night no matter what. Uh, I know the whitetail guys are really dialed into the moon phase. There may be something with it, for, but for me and my hunting, it doesn't matter if it's a full moon, if it's a half moon, if it's a quarter moon, whatever it is, I'm hunting elk. And, and I find like huge rut fests and these rut fests are where you kill a bull. Like sure, it's great to find a group of cows and one nice six point bull and make a play on them. But where I really kill elk is when I get into the party. When I get into to 200 elk and there's all these different groups of cows and these different six point bulls calling. So that's always what I'm looking for is looking for these rut fests. But, but I'm not much of a moon guy. I, I, I just don't find much correlation to that and to my elk hunting. And I've read studies on the moon and like um, the full moon and, and humans like in the ER and things of that nature. And there really isn't much correlation to it. So I don't know what to believe. I, I, these white tail guys are really into it. Maybe there's something to it that I'm not dialed in. But for me, I, I don't. Don't uh, put much emphasis in it. Yep, and I really believe this rut ebbs and flows. Like elk rut from the 5th of September, or even the 1st of September, all the way to October 15th. And they go in the rut and they go out of the rut. It just, when those cows come into estrus, they'll rut super hard to breed those cows. And then heck, it can be sick. September 20th, the peak of the rut in my eye, or September 22nd, it can be the peak of the rut and I'll see a giant bull that he's been breeding and screaming for two days, screaming his brains out. And all of a sudden the cows are out of estrus and I'll see that bull just feeding by himself on a grass meadow. Could care less about a cow. It ebbs and flows, it comes in and out. You just wanna catch one of those waves. More questions? Yeah. Maybe the mic for the YouTube or for the mm-hmm. YouTube followers. Yep. So, a question we've had two that are kind of similar. So, let's say you're chasing elk. The wind shifts, and now the wind is all in your face, but the elk are going this way. So, would you stop and try to circle around them to get the wind right, or would you just go at them with knowing that they're going to smell you in the wind, even though they're three, four hundred yards ahead of you? So, how would you play that with the winds in their favor? You can see them, but you know you got to get on top of them. So, would you backtrack and leave them and come back around, or would you just try to? Let the wind do the thing and let them smell you. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so um, wind is gonna be key and number one when stalking and playing these elk. So if I've got a bad wind into those elk or the, uh, the, the wind's starting to get shifty, uh, I'm just gonna try to keep my eye on them and see where they end up. Like, like circling, making a big circle around these elk may work if I know they're down in a drainage or I know their exact location, but elk love to move and they love to travel country. So if they're moving and all of a sudden the wind shifts and I've got a bad wind into, into these elk, I'm just gonna look for a spot where I can try to keep my eyes on these elk and maybe see where they end up, where I can make a play in the evening. Uh, but, but once those winds are bad, I'm not gonna move into these elk. Like that, that for me is make another game plan, whether it's circling around, whether it's trying to to keep my eyes on them, uh, 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 move around, but the, the wind is number one. With a bad wind, they smell you every single time. So I think my move in that situation would be to try to keep my eyes on them and then like make a play for the evening, like a high percentage play for the evening where I, I could use that wind. Yep, I think so. So playing off uh, talking about the wind and you're talking about using your range finder, you're sneak, sneaking in on a stock, how are you checking your wind? Talk a little bit about what are you using, what are you doing to check the wind as you go in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, wind is key and we always need to, to keep mindful of what the wind's doing. So uh, a, a lot of this, again, plays into that knowing uh, what the winds are doing, knowing your directionals and your thermals. So I'm checking the wind with the wind checker or the wind floater. That's what that stuff's called, I finally remembered. Uh, that wind floater, you can watch that stuff float off. But there's this deal where, where when you're hunting elk, when you're hunting elk in the mountains, Elk like to be where that wind swirls around. I've got this drainage that is so good. There's elk in there every time I go in there. And they sit in the bottom of this drainage and they rut like crazy. Again, I told you I, I, I'm hard-headed. I have to learn lessons over and over and over again, right? And so this drainage, there's always elk in there and there's always big bulls in there. They're always rutting. Every time I dive down in there, those things win me. So the problem is, is I'm hunting elk on the lee wind side. So the lee wind side, what I mean by that is the directionals are coming this way, and as they come over the top, they wash your machine over this back side of this ridge. Elk love to hang in these basins like that, or they love to hang in a basin that's on the lee wind side. The wind just swirls in there. You're fighting a losing game. Like you gotta have a consistent wind to kill these things. So when I talk about your all-in moment, like a lot of that is due to the wind. The wind's gotta be steady. It's gotta be consistent. If it's not, like I'll play it uh, uh, real patiently and I'll try to put those elk away and I'll try to get a play in that evening. Again, that evening time, that last hour is the best time to kill an elk. Those downhill thermals get really consistent and, and you can play off that wind. So if the wind isn't right, it's, it's like just hold back and wait for a better opportunity. And, and then when these elk get on this lee wind side, like this drainage that I'm talking about, man, I've been down in that thing a half dozen times and I've spooked elk a half dozen times. Like I have just learned that I cannot go down in this drainage because it sits on the lee wind side and the wind swirls down there like crazy. So, so what's my solution? Creative thinking, again, is rewarded in elk hunting. So they're in the lee wind side. I've learned through six times of screwing this up every single time that I can't get away with it. So what do I do? I sit up there and I'm patient. One of my biggest bulls I killed, you probably saw him on here, like this big timber bull. He went like uh, mid 340s or whatever. He was down in that basin rutting, and I learned my lesson. I didn't go in and chase him because he's on the lee wind side. Again, the ridge comes this way, washer machine's in there, and it's always swirly. You can't get a steady wind. You check your wind checker one time, it's going this way. The next time, it's going this way. There's no steady wind down there. So I sat up and I waited and I was patiently. Late morning, that bull took his cows and he worked up out of that drainage and he worked to the dominant wind side. Now I've got this side and the wind blowing against it this way, it's dominant and it's steady. All of a sudden I was able to get, get by that bull, I was able to shadow him to his bed, he started feeding around, I put a perfect arrow into him. Took me six times to learn my lesson in that spot, but I finally killed a great bull out of there. Creative thinking is rewarded. You have to play the wind. So pay attention to how the wind moves through these mountains. Pay attention to these directionals and these thermals. Pay attention to lee wind side, dominant wind side. Learn these winds inside and out. Like, like more stocks are busted by the wind on elk than anything else. So learn these winds inside and out. Learn this mountain range you're hunting and how the winds affect it in the mountains. Nice. 
what's something on your on your bow or shooting equipment that has really elevated your success or created that uh, confidence that you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a couple things on my bow. Like, uh, uh, I go deep down the rabbit hole uh, of all of these different facets. All these different facets that go into being a successful elk hunter, I dive deep into. So, so my bow, you know, I've shot indoor, I've shot outdoor, I've shot 3D. I hang out with these guys that are really good shooters, better shooters than me. Uh, uh, I hang out and I learn from them and I ask them questions. So, so like a lot of my confidence from my bow, like being a good archery shooter is, is to let go of your ego and, and to make form changes that help you overall in your shooting. It's really easy to stay in your comfort bubble of where you're at with your shooting. To stay in your comfort bubble and not make changes and say it's good enough to hit an elk. But the really good elk hunter, he dissects his shooting and he tries to figure out how he can make himself better. You look to those guys that are better than you, better on the 3D, better on the indoor. What are they using? And so I've taken a lot of tricks from these guys. I mean, you'll see my bow. I wish I had it up here with me. Um, but I, I've got to, I'm going to go shoot that mountain archery fest here on Saturday, which these, these uh, mountain archery fests, shooting around your buddies, uh, shooting on these ski resorts, like they're, they're going to... They're, they're gonna point out your flaws in your shooting, shooting uphill, shooting downhill. Uh, a lot of my shots on elk come from my knees. I'm 20 yards worse off my knees than I am from my feet. So I learn all this. I shoot in the wind at my house. I know how the wind affects my arrows. I go deep down all these rabbit holes to make all the improvements I can to be the very best shooter I can be. So I take a lot of my, my, my shooting, I, I take from these guys. And so my bow setup, it's gonna look a little bit different than most guys. Like I shoot a 15 inch stabilizer out front, I shoot a 12 inch in back. I shoot six ounces of weight in front, I shoot 10 ounces of weight in back. So I'm adding a pound to my bow. Heavier bows aim better, they aim slower. It's not so erratic, your movement on it. I wanna shoot the most forgiving setup I can. When I'm working with the tune of my bow, the way the arrows come out of my bow, I'm making sure my arrows are perfectly spined at my bow. You know, elk, you need great penetration on elk, but I don't go overboard. It, it's like this fine line between great penetration of shooting a heavier arrow, which heavier arrows have better momentum energy than lighter arrows. Uh, they quiet down your bow, but the thing you lose with a heavier arrow is range forgiveness. You hit that, that elk and you're one yard off, you're two yard off, you might miss that elk by the spot. So I want good range forgiveness as well. So the perfect mix for me is about a 450 grain arrow. I shoot a 26 and a half inch draw length. I've got short little arms. I, you know, but, but I shoot it comfortably and it's not just shoot it comfortably like in my backyard, my flip flops. I shoot it comfortably on my knees. I shoot it comfortably shooting downhill, shooting uphill. And then I work on that execution that I'm telling you guys about. Like that pull, pull, pull on my release, letting that pin float on that elk. Like that's a huge step for me. It makes precise shots. And sure, I'll kill animals if I punch a trigger or whatever, but I'm just not making as precise a shot as I can make. I'm not being as good an archer as I can make. And I think the key to being a good archer is making these form changes, making these changes to your bow. I also use a, a black gold uh, slider sight. Sometimes things happen quick with elk, but I love to like know that exact range of that elk and be able to hold my pin right on the vitals and let it float. The, this mover sight will let me dial right to 45 yards so I don't have to pin gap. It'll let me dial to 52. So I know my arrow's gonna hit exactly where my pin is. That's another thing I do is I, I, I use that. But, but I, I think these form changes are super important. Things that we can change with our form, shooting with better shooters, like, like learning these little things, uh, you know, wh whatever stage we're in, whether it's grip, whether it's execution, and, 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 and really building a controlled shot, building these steps in your head that are repeatable, that you can talk yourself through a shot. Whatever your important steps are, three, four, five stops, steps, like build this shooting process that you can repeat. So you use this shooting process when you're in your backyard and your flip-flops by yourself, you use it when you're with your buddies shooting. You use it and you put yourself in these high pressure situations throughout the year. And you practice, practice, practice. That's how I build confidence in it. And then when it comes season, I just know I can make that shot. I've done it just time and time again. So that for me is like my biggest trick. Yeah. Uh, specifically archery hunting cow elk. Oh, nice. 
Yeah, um, cow elk, got to get that good elk meat. Like that's one of the beautiful things about elk is we get all the, the, the best organic, nutrients-rich protein we can get. And hunting cows is a great thing. Like all of a sudden we can add all this experience elk hunting by hunting cows and we're still hunting elk. So again, it's just going to make us better elk hunters and we get to bring home this good protein. So same thing hunting cows, like like you're going to be hunting cows like I'm hunting a herd bull. When I'm hunting herd bull or I'm hunting bulls in September, I'm hunting the cows. So the the cows, um, they don't hang as in, in... in his rugged spots, they're going to hang in lush, good feeding features. Where the cows are now is where they're going to be come September, or at least those same drainages, same locations. And when I'm scouting elk, like I'm looking uh, uh, for not only elk, but I'm looking for elk sign. Like when you see rubs, you know the elk are, are uh, rutting in there. So if you can go scout country and you're seeing elk rubs and you're seeing wallows and you're seeing tracks, you're like, gosh, I think this is a good elk spot. Like it's it's connecting those dots and paying attention to that sign and what the land will give you. So I I don't think hunting cows is any different. I think you're going to hunt them like you're hunting a big bull. And I think you're going to get a ton of elk hunting experience. And I think you can take that same skill set to hunting bulls when you draw that bull tag. I think that's awesome. Yep. Yep. How How about taking us to that shot moment? You, hit, you said there's an all-in moment. Is this a, a, a series of steps falling into place for you, or is this something based on experience? Maybe describe one of your successful shots on a bull, mm-hmm. you know, right when you're in close, because I hear a lot, you know, but I don't know, what does that look like? Is it, a, is it a, you know, when you're getting closer and closer, and then you say, okay, this is it. Mm-hmm. Can you describe it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, God, great question. So this all-in moment, This is when I see this bull susceptible when I can get an arrow in him. And and I'm never trying to rush or move quick. Like I'm not trying to draw and come around the tree. But it's just like I'm trying to get myself into position for this shot constantly. So I'm moving and flowing with these elk as they're flowing. And and I'm moving slowly and I'm moving controlled and I'm not giving myself away. But, But finally it's going to start to present itself. I'm going to get close enough or maybe I see him go over a little ridge and I'm 60 yards away. All the elk go over top the ridge. All of a sudden I can't see any elk. They can't see me either. I know if I make it to the top of that ridge and I come over that top, that bull's going to be in range. I'm going to have a shot at him right there. So, so I'm looking for this moment where I can close in, where I can close the deal. Maybe I move into position and all these elk are starting to funnel by me and I'm just holding still and I'm just waiting. And I, I'm waiting for this bull to come by. And once that bull comes by and I see their eyes down, that's when I'm drawing back slow. And then uh, the only cow call I make is to stop a bull. Ew. That's the only cow call I make. And that's when I'm at full draw and I'm getting ready to shoot that bull. And so, like, I'm just waiting for this moment to present itself when, when I can make this all in moment. So it isn't a run. It isn't a hurry and get around this tree. It's setting myself up and letting things develop around me. Like, a lot of times, I'll get in range of the cows, and, and now I'm just waiting. The cows don't know I'm there. The bull doesn't know I'm there. I'm waiting for the bull to come back and check these cows. That big 331 I killed, I stalked into his cows. Uh, it was a rainy cold day. I had a really good wind. I snuck into his cows one time and I got in close. The wind got a little dicey. I was like 40 yards away from some of those cows. I never saw the bull. He's around there somewhere, but I don't know where he's at. I actually backed out of there. I got nervous about the wind and I backed out. And and as I backed out, I came back and I, I was sitting there for like maybe 10, 15 minutes, maybe 200 yards away from these elk. Wind kind of got a little bit more stable and I went down the other side of this ridge line and as I start going down, I catch this cow in front of me and she goes up over the ridge, right, like that. Elk are always moving. She's up over the ridge and I go, oh, that's kind of funny, you know, and I kind of set up and pretty soon I hear that bull bugle and he's coming and that cow just walked by it like 45 yards. And so, like, all of a sudden, I heard him bugling. He sounds like he's in front of this, these other cows. Like, my thought is, is he's coming. And so I just set up. I just got ready. And here this bull comes, and he walked out right to 45 yards. He stops, bugles at that cow. He's got no idea I'm there. I can't see any of the cows. I'm able to draw back and settle my pin, talk myself through that shot, and execute that good shot on that bull. So I'm really waiting for my moment to present itself. I'm waiting for the right angle, the right shot. I'm waiting for that bull to make a mistake. And once you're in so close, there's not a bunch of moves to make. 
Unless you've got ungulation or you've got land to play with, you're going to get stuck on these elk. You're going to get stuck at 80 yards. You're going to get stuck at 100 yards. You know, you may get stuck at 60 yards, no shot. And, and a lot of times I can shoot every cow in the group. I just, the bull is on the other side of the cows or the bull's running around chasing another bull and things are going crazy. I just want to keep calm. I want to keep my element of surprise. I don't want to make any moves. I don't want to give myself away. I want to keep playing the game. Like this bull will eventually make a mistake. Eventually, he's going to come back around to check the cows. Eventually, like, I, I can shoot 20 cows right in front of me. Like, chances are this bull's going to come back and make a mistake and give me a shot. So, so I'm just waiting and I'm letting things develop until I see that shot develop. You're going to get stuck on these stalks. You're going to have to hold up. You may get to 100 yards three different times on the herd, but the minute they go over that ridge and all disappear, that's your all-in moment. Good win. I'm to that ridge. My ridge line assaults, and I'm coming over the top, and I'm trying to see them first. And, and his horns are a beacon to where he's at. Five foot of antlers that are going to stick above that ridge is a beacon. You can tell which way he's looking, which way his tines are facing. If he's looking away, you can come up and try to shoot. If he's looking right at you, like that's the time to freeze and just hold still. Horns are at you. Maybe he heard something. May, you know, let him go back to rutting. Let him go back to being an elk. But I'm, I'm really letting these situations develop, and, and I'm not pushing my stock to failure. I'm not stalking these elk until I blow them out of the country because that doesn't do me any good. I'm stalking in and getting as close as the country will allow it, as close as the elk will allow it, and then I'm letting this situation develop. And I'm gonna keep playing this out over and over and over again until I get my chance or until I see him around a ridge or uh, where I can use the ungulation to then get in close and pop in 40 yards. So that's what I'd say when I'm trying to look for my shot, my all-in moment. Yep. All right, no more questions? Okay, gotcha. Yeah, uh, camo. I really like light-colored camo. It seems like darker uh, camo. You look like a, 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 a black vertical humanoid out there in meadow grass. So, you know, I, I, I like camo, but really uh, elk see movement far more than they see your camo pattern. I hunted solid color for years. Like they see that movement. Any movement you make, that's what they see. That's what they pick up on. I mean, think about your 3D that you have. Wearing camo or not wearing camo, you got your bino harness, you got this bow in front of you with arrows coming down, arrows sticking off, you've got hat, you've got dark figure. Like they, they just don't pick you out unless you're moving. Now, that being said, I like to keep to the edges of the timber. I like to keep to the shadows. They can pick you out way easier in the middle of a meadow than they can the timber. So anytime I'm about ready to walk across a meadow, you can bet I'm glass in all surrounding edges of it because you stick out like a sore thumb in that meadow. You also stick out like a sore thumb coming over ridgelines. So anytime I'm working a ridgeline, I, I'll work 10 feet down off that ridgeline so I'm not skyline. They can see you from miles skyline moving across the ridgeline. So I'm trying to stay off the skyline. So as far as camo, I really like, like light colors. Light tan seems to be really good for elk as it tends to blend in with those grasses. But really, it's about movement. If you hold still, like even if I'm stalking in and an elk catches me moving, like she snaps her head around and she sees me moving and I freeze, sometimes I'll be stuck like this for 40 minutes but she'll go back to feeding and forget about me. She doesn't see that movement. Like these ungulates, they see movement far more than they see the camo pattern. It's about staying still. Another one of the worst mistakes I see is, is we're hunting along and all of a sudden we've got a herd of elk and my buddy drops like this. Like how much movement is that? You're better off to stay still and not move. That dropping down to your knees, sure that knee line profile is way better for elk that are approaching or if you're stuck in a meadow, but the minute you see elk is not the time to drop. They're gonna see that movement like crazy and once they see movement, they key into you and now they're waiting for you to move again and when you move again, they're out. They're gonna bark at you, they're gonna rock and roll and get out of there. So I really focus on my movements on these elk more so than I do my camo patterns. I don't camo up my face. I don't use face paint. I don't use a face mask. I don't use gloves. I, I just, um, for me, it's all about movement on these elk. Yep. How is the wolf doing to the uh, behavior of the elk in that hunt? One more time. How are the, the wolf uh, acting, making the elk act different? The movement of the elk and stuff. 
Yeah, so those wolves, they're just being hunted from like all sides now, like the wolf pressure up north. Um, you know, I've heard guys say that the elk don't call as much around those wolves or, um, uh, you know, you just have different predators out there. So I notice when I'm on elk, if, if the wolves get into them, they're gonna bust them just the same as I am. So it definitely makes them more cantankerous. I mean, the biggest thing I noticed with, with the elk and the wolves is just lowering the population of them. You know, some of those populations went from 20,000 elk to below 2,000 elk, like the northern greater Yellowstone herd or uh, the, the herd around Elk City, around Idaho. It was a huge success story for elk, but those, those wolves just got in there and decimated those populations. So I've heard, I've heard guys say that they call less. You know, I don't know if I've noticed that just with my own experiences, but there's other predators out hunting those elk. So I think they are making them more wary. So I think some of these wilderness elk, like uh, elk that are high pressured are a different species than elk that are low pressured. Elk that are high pressured are like a damn antelope. They know what humans are and they know humans are chasing them and they're looking for you. They just catch movement far more. They look for danger more. But you go into the middle of the wilderness or you get into one of these private ranches or places where these elk don't get pressured, they just act different. That you can get away with me way more. I can like sneak in the timber and they don't see me. You just get away with way more. They're not as on edge. And so like if the one thing that I notice, I would say like these wilderness elk are more on edge. They're more, they're chased by predators year round now. They have to watch out for not only humans, but they have to watch out for wolves too. So like I think if, if I could notice anything from my own experiences, it would be like elk numbers dropping. Now they've recovered in a lot of places now that they're letting us control the populations, which they should. Biologists that control all our ungulate populations and bear populations, and all of a sudden the Fed said, well, well, no, you can't control the wolf populations. They're protected. So they were let to, they were to run rampant in our mountains. They were able to, to kill these elk, and a lot of them would sport kill them. I, I've come up on hillsides where they just killed four or five elk, and they, they didn't even have a chance to eat them. They just uh, 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 bled out their throats or had them by the throat and just left them dead on the snow like they sport kill, you know? So like they unchecked, I've definitely seen our population populations go down. Now that we're able to control their populations, there's hunting and trapping season, we, we've been able to keep them in check a lot better. Uh, but I would say the one thing that I've noticed is that those wilderness elk that were less wary are a little bit more switched on now. Yep. All right, you guys. Thanks a bunch for sitting in. Elk seminar. Really appreciate it. Really fun to share that information I've gained over the years. So Thanks, you guys. o'clock today and did this presentation. So thank you again. We really appreciate you. Good. We're going to do a couple of drawings. We have a few drawings. So we're going to give away this ice chest first. And then we have the Swaros that were limited tickets. Then we're going to do the Big Ten. So we do have some online ones for the Swarovskis and also the Big Ten. So if they're not here, we'll call them on the phone and we're going to go through that list one at a time. So on the Big Ten, there's 10 items and first person gets first choice. We're going to go systematically all through it. So let's give this ice chest away. Is there a kid that wants to come up and pull a lucky ticket? Come on up, buddy. Close your eyes. 
says it's got a Bob. Bob So. Is there a Bob So still here? Ticket number 340411. 340411. Yep, you're here? Okay, so these are the, your choice, either 10 or 12, the brand new Swarovskis. Again, we had some on sale tickets, so we do have, in case they're not here, we will call them. Got another kid who wants to come up? Across the line? Yeah. That yeah. means the line on the back just means it's a name. So let's see here. That means they bought it online. Okay. 283190 Edward Turpin. Is there Edward Edward Turpin here? Congratulations. We'll call him in a second. Do we call him? Do we call him on the phone? Or we want to go to the Big Ten? Keep going? Okay, we're gonna keep going. All right. Congratulations, Edward. So the Big Ten, pull one, and we'll systematically go through all ten items. And the first person gets first choice all the way down to the last item. Again, we had pre-sales, so if it has the line, then it'll be online. Okay, we got another kid want to come up? Different kid? Anybody want to pull? Make somebody's world? Make somebody's day? Right there? All right, come on up. Come on up. Is that the brother? All right, we got the brother up here. All right, big guy. Come on up here. Stay right here. Close your eyes. Oh, close your eyes. Pull one ticket out, okay? Just one. Well, just one. Drop one. There you go. Good. Get that the mic over there. Nice job. Nice job. Good job. Woo! Okay. It has a line behind it. What's your name? Oh, we don't need that one. You keep Sorry? That in your pocket. How do they pick? We're going to call them. So we'll call them. So it looks like number one. What's your name? 
and hopefully they answer. So 98, so 31198. So. Exactly. 31, 198. Oh, Terry. Terry Herndon. He said you're kidding me. <laughs> 131, 198. That's right. I'm going to have somebody field verify. We always field verify everything. We got the answers. We draw. Okay. That's the first perk is Terry. I don't have Terry's number. You need to call? He wants the big rifle. Okay. He wants the big rifle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let him know you said okay, that, Glenn. So let's pull number two. All right. Here we're okay, gonna close your eyes again. Pull another one. Want, uh, I'll call. Pull one more. Just one ticket. Nice job. Uh, okay, give that to Mr. Mike. Okay. This one has a name. Becky Friddle. Okay, right. come on up, Becky. <laughs> Going good. Terry, are you on the phone? Uh, we have a crowd that's really upset with you right now. Yeah, I apologize. All right. Well, we're doing the uh, Big Ten, and you are ticket number one, and so these people want to go to the next ticket. So what would you like out of our Big Ten? You are number one. 15 by 56 for Oskies. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Woo. All right. Congratulations. We're, all right. Congratulations. We are moving on. Thank you, sir. We have the Oskies for you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, so we have down. Becky, right? We're going to write it right here. Yeah, okay. To write uh, right here for me. Terry's. Okay, Becky, you're here, right? What is your flavor? We have Big Ten. Man Okay. Uh, we're going to have another kid come pull. You going to we'll, do the we'll bow? Number three on, so if number three wants to pull, we'll get that one on deck. Would you like to look on the board and see what you'd like? Uh, yeah. Okay. Why don't you guys can we put it up? You can have anything on the board except for the... Come on, stay up here, buddy. <laughs> you want to pull another ticket? We got to pull some more tickets. You want to help? All right. Or your brother can come up and help, too. You guys can take turns. Come on, help, too. We got okay, 10 so tickets. Just write her name right there. All right. You get to pull one more, and then your brother will go next, okay? So pull one more. Close your eyes. Pick one. Just one. All right. Go give that to Mr. Mike. There you go. Okay. This one has a blue line behind it. Ticket number 31165. 31165. 31, Mike, 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 you're number three, sir. And then Big Ten, so would you like to go tell us what you like out of the Big Ten? You get item number three. The cooler and the binos are gone. No. <laughs> I'll trade you for whatever you get for my bush nails. <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple of hand, there's three different handguns. There's a couple of rifles. There's a tripod. Pull one more. Okay, your turn. Pull one. Close your eyes. Pull one ticket. The firearms, as everybody knows, will take your name. Then at Sportsman's Warehouse on Phoenix on Yorkshire, they're a great partner with us, and they takes about three business days, and they'll have that gun for you, whatever one you select. All right, one ticket. All right, give that to Mr. Mike, please. Another line. Another line? Yep. Okay. I don't know what name. Okay, no name. This one is uh, 31146. Happens to be on that page there. 31, 146. Is there a Harold Lee here? Harold Lee.
fourth pick. Hello, we are not available now. Uh oh. Please leave your name and phone number after the beep. We will return your call. It's a local number. Hello, Harold. This is Mike with Christianers America. We are doing the Big Ten drawing, and you are number four for your choice. Um, so if you call me back at 602 501 1645. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Is it a tripod? Yes. The tripod? Okay. So we'll, I'm going to send him a text. All right. Give Mike your ticket now that you okay. pulled. That's number five, right? Number five. So it has another blue line. 